Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the County Council. Uh, we are going to start this afternoon's uh, work with a presentation and proclamation recognizing Cecilia Rojas of the Community Reach Language Opportunity Program uh, for her incredible recognition and achievements, and that will be led by myself and the members of the Education and Culture Committee, Council Members Jawando, Mink, and Albernaz. Cecilia would like to come on down, and everyone who, I see Kathy Stevens, if anyone else wants to come down and show support for Cecilia. There we go. Okay, it is good to see everybody out here to celebrate Cecilia. Uh, right? And not only has Cecilia had an incredible tenure uh, here in Montgomery County and in Maryland with more than 30 years of providing uh, English language classes and proficiency to, to members of our community. She actually uh, began as an instructor in 1993 uh, and has served as program director for the last two decades. And that is why earlier this month, Cecilia was honored as the winner of the Maryland Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages Award for, and the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, at the TESOL -E conference. So congratulations <laughs> on that. Um, you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of us, uh, my colleagues, who, who want to speak, and so, so I'll just be brief and say, you know, the passion that Cecilia has shown uh, in her personal life and in her professional life is exactly what we try to foster and support here in Montgomery County. It is why we have an incredible social safety net where we enable and support people to be their best selves to live the lives they want, to have the skills and the education and the proficiency so that they can succeed here in Montgomery County. And it is because of individuals and instructors like Cecilia and all the organizations and the board members and the funders and everyone who helps make this possible. So Cecilia, thank you for everything that you've done in our community. And now I'll turn it over to the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, Council Member Jawanda. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and Cecilia. Congratulations. Um, it is uh, it's amazing. You are a founding board member of one of the best organizations we have um, and, and Mikhail. And it's one of the best because I was just talking to, we have a council member for a day here today. We have, you might notice we have an extra member. Um, and I was talking to her parents during our lunch. Uh, her, her dad is from Nigeria, like my dad. Over a third of our county residents are foreign born. And many come to this country and seek of opportunity, which is a great American story, but needing uh, to fit in and show their talents and abilities and skills, because we have them. But it's just we have to make sure people can understand and can benefit from them. And step one in that for so many immigrants is learning English and being able to be seen for who they really are, the value that they had and being able to contribute. So what you've done for the last 30 years is help people contribute to our county and to our state by showing who they really are. And by allowing the rest of us who are people who speak, you know, I, I speak one good language and several very badly, <laughs> but to benefit from all that they have to offer. Um, and I just wanna thank you, we all wanna thank you for that. Um, and we're sad to see you go, but we know you're not going far. So. Okay, there we go. Said like true nonprofits, she's not going anywhere. Um, you're not going anywhere. Uh, we're, we're honored to continue to celebrate you and you're not going anywhere. And, and, but when you do, whenever that is, we're thankful for that too. 
Um, and so I'll turn it over next to Councilmember Avernaz and Councilmember Mink, my colleagues on the Education and Culture Committee. Cecilia, gracias uh, por el papel que has hecho en nuestra comunidad por tantos años, la dedicación, las contribu contribuciones, uh, el impacto que has hecho es increíble. Uh, generaciones de gente en esta comunidad han aprendido cómo hablar inglés, pero más importante que eso, han ganado confianza, han ganado amistades y ahora tienen conexiones por el trabajo que has hecho. Así que muchísimas gracias por todo lo que has hecho para nuestra comunidad y para mí personalmente, de verdad. Um, I want to thank Cecilia for the incredible impact that she has had in our community for generations. And it goes much further than just helping no, new generations of residents uh, be able to speak English. She has helped build confidence. She has helped build friendships. She has helped build bridges in our community that are critical. And too often, our immigrant community are seen as scapegoats, as taking more than they give. And we know that's not true. And so thank you, Cecilia, and for your incredible dedication and your incredible commitment. I try to make it a point every year to attend the graduation ceremony virtually of the incredible program that she's been the director of all these years. And I'm always struck by the stories that you hear from the graduates of the program. It is truly moving. And I can't think of a better person to honor and recognize than Cecilia. Así que muchísimas gracias. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Council Member Kristen Mink. I represent District 5. And um, I'm honored to represent a district that is full of um, multilingual immigrants, um, uh, first generation families and uh, many folks who are taking advantage of the services that Cecilia has been on the leading edge of ensuring that we have readily accessible and available in Montgomery County. Um, what you have done over these decades has been to help us truly live the values, live the values that are core to Montgomery County. Choosing work like this reflects uh, the care and the value that you put into the diversity that we see in Montgomery County. You're helping our residents to leverage their, uh, their multilingual, multicultural backgrounds um, as the asset that they are for our entire community. So I am I'm so grateful for the work that you have done here. So glad to hear that you're gonna be around. I know you haven't said that yet, but <laughs> I think maybe if we all keep saying it, uh, and I will pass it back now to Oh, I get to invite up Cecilia. Thank you so much. I am overwhelmed, but anyway, uh, good afternoon to you all. It is a privilege to be recognized by Co Council President Evan Glass and County Council members. I would also like to thank the Council for its steady commitment for serving the people of Montgomery County. Your dedication and hard work are truly appreciated. Welcoming immigrants is part of what makes Montgomery County a great place to live. You give programs like Language Outreach the opportunity to serve our immigrant communities who, who face challenges and hardships. The path to learning a new language is not without its difficulties. But our new American community has demonstrated incredible persistence and strength of spirit. LOP is happy to also offer citizenship classes. Many of our students want to become USA citizens because they want to be part of the US democratic system. I would like to recognize our incredible students they are living testimony to this strong spirit, their commitment to learning courage and in the face of adversity, and firm determination to succeed have forever touched my heart. I have been working on this field for over 30 years, and it has been a privilege to work with so many dedicated teachers. Join us today 
are David Stowns and Kevin Borger. And also our coordinators, Carlos Gutierrez and Olga Ponce, Chaya Tutors, volunteers and supporters who have made this journey possible. The tireless effort, dedication, and compassion have created an environment where dreams are encouraged and possibilities to flourish. I would like to thank Agnes Science, who gave me the opportunity to be part of community research in Montgomery County, a wonderful organization who provides resources to the most needed in Montgomery County. Additionally, I would like to mention with gratitude Kathy Stevens and the Montgomery County Coalition for Adult English, literacy, no, it's by Michelle. It is an organization that provides English language programs, support, and education. They are the hub of TISO program in Montgomery County, and they are godsend for administrators and instructors for diverse organizations. The professional development and peer sharing opportunities help to create more connected and inclusive community to us all. I also I would like to thank my husband, Walter Rojas, for his support and encouragement throughout my career. Without his love and understanding, I would not have been able to achieve what I have. Thank you once again for this wonderful recognition. I look forward to continue to work serving Montgomery County residents. Thank you. up so we can read this proclamation. There you go, Cecilia. The County Council of Montgomery County Proclamation, whereas Cecilia Rojas is the two, 2023 winner of the Maryland Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages Lifetime Achievement Award, an honor given to an individual who has been working in the TESOL field in Maryland for at least 15 years and has made substantial and exemplary contributions to the field. And whereas Mrs. Rojas has been the director of the language, has been and will be the director of the language <laughs> outreach program of community reach of Montgomery County for 22 years and Whereas Mrs. Rojas was a founding member of the Montgomery County Coalition for Adult English Literacy Board of Directors and has long been a leader in meeting the needs of Montgomery County's English speakers and of other languages, students, and families. And? Whereas Montgomery County is one of the most diverse counties in the United States with a fast-growing immigrant population and more than 134,000 residents who self-identify as speaking English less than very well and... Whereas nearly 10,000 adult students have taken English language classes through Ms. Rojas' program and over 4,000 children of English language learners have participated in child care programming and... Whereas Cecilia has taken a hands-on approach to helping countless language outreach program students become U.S. citizens and... Now therefore it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby honors Cecilia Rojas for a lifetime of advocacy and dedicated service to non-English speaking individuals and their families from our community. Presented on this 28th day of November in the year 2023. Just to say, pretty much everybody who's here. I'm not here for the public here. Even you guys come on up. I invited your constituent to the public today. Since you try to get into the debate with me. He asked, he asked a question. I answered it. He asked another question. I answered it. I, I didn't like that. He, he self identified as a resident of the uh, Woodside. Yeah, 30 years. 
Which is code for you don't belong here, I guess? Yeah, yeah. It's like, I, my opinion about it's only yours. Is that like, I came on the Mayflower? Yep. <laughs> when did you get here? That's exactly right. Yeah. Let's say cheese. 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 Che
Um, as you might remember, during the review of Bill 2523, uh, which did a methodology change in how we calculate the biannual adjustments to impact taxes, we realized that the exact same methodology that was being amended there was being used to recalculate the biannual adjustments to the park improvement and civic improvement fund payments. Um, and so this is a change to go from the current um, average over two years of how the payments are calculated to now a cumulative change on how these payments are calculated, which will actually keep up with inflation better. And this also implements the same 20% cap on how much this biannual adjustment can occur, very similar to what was in the impact uh, tax changes. Uh, the Planning Board is making one minor modification to this ZTA. Um, it was drafted and sent to you guys before the final language actually was adopted for the bill. And the word adjustment was added after the word rate in one of the lines of the uh, ZTA, just to provide clarity that is the rate adjustment that is being adjusted, not just the rate. And with that, I conclude my comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Berberk, for, for the testimony on those two ZTA, uh, on those two, uh, yeah, those two ZTAs. Uh, there are no other speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Uh, next is a public hearing on Zoning Text Amendment 2307, Bethesda Overlay Zone Park Improvement Payouts and Downtown Silver Spring Overlay Zone Civic Improvement Funds. This CTA would modify the method used to calculate the biennial adjustments and set an inflation limit in the Bethesda Overlay Zone's Park Improvement pay Payment and the Downtown Silver Spring Overlay Zone Civic Improvement Fund and generally amend the density provisions of the Bethesda Overlay Zone and the Downtown Silver Spring Overlay Zone. A Planning Housing Parks Committee work session is scheduled for December 11th. Those wishing to submit material before the Council's consideration should do so by the close of business on December 4th. Uh, we had one person speaking, that was Mr. Bobert. There are no additional speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on Bill 4023, Tree Canopy and Roadside Tree Requirements Fee Revisions. This bill would amend the fees payable to the Tree Canopy Conservation Account, amend fees payable to the Street Tree Planting Fund, and generally amend the laws regarding tree canopy requirements and roadside tree work. A Transportation and Environment Committee work session is scheduled for December 11th. Those wishing to submit material before the Council's, for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business on December 4th. And we have five speakers for this public hearing. Uh, I'd like to invite Amanda Farber, uh, Anna Mudd, Caroline Taylor, Deborah Street, and Geet Van Brant up to the table. Good to see you all in person. We'll start with Ms. Farber. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Farber. You have the written testimony of support for Bill 4023 from the Montgomery County Forest Coalition. So I wanted to come today to just offer words of thanks since it is that season. First, I'm thankful to Council President Glass and Vice President Friedson for introducing this timely common sense bill and to all of you for being co-sponsors. You may recall when the coalition was here for the forest conservation law amendments earlier this year that we stated that there were other laws related to tree canopy that needed updating and strengthening as well. It's been almost exactly 10 years since the county's roadside tree protection law and the tree canopy law were adopted. And it's been just as long since the tree replacement and planting fees associated with those laws have been revised. It's important that those fees be amended to keep pace with current planting costs. Next, I'm very grateful to the county employees who work hard to implement these laws and plant trees and for the programs including the DOT Street Tree Planting Program and the Tree Montgomery Program that make a difference in supporting the county's urban tree canopy. I'm also thankful for the trees themselves, from the mature canopy to newly planted saplings. They're a critical part of our urban infrastructure and climate solution. Lastly, I'm appreciative for the organizations and individuals that make up the Montgomery County Forest Coalition. This coalition is dedicated to working with the county to continue to improve our forest and tree canopy laws and resources. 
We look forward to continuing to do so, and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Uh, Ms. Mudd. Uh, your microphone. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Mudd, and I am the Senior Director of Policy for Potomac Conservancy. On behalf of our 30,000 members, I just want to thank all of you for your leadership on this important issue. Uh, I'm also representing 12 organizations associated with the Montgomery County Forest Coalition. Uh, we submitted testimony yesterday in support of Council Bill 4023. These organizations uh, range from small neighborhood associations to large statewide advocacy groups. Uh, we all recognize the critical uh, need for this legislation, and we want to thank you all for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Taylor. Well, hello. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving extended. Um, I am uh, one of the people who plants some of these trees, or our organization. I'm Caroline Taylor. I'm with Montgomery Countryside Alliance. We are a member of the Montgomery County Forest Coalition, and we are proud partners with Montgomery County Planning with our relief program. Um, we have planted to date somewhere around 3,200 trees since 2019 pilot. Uh, we plant along riparian uh, buffers, stream corridors in Montgomery County's agricultural reserve. And I can tell you one thing, of all the joys of this program, one of the joys has not been the rising costs of everything. The trees, the tree guards, the tree stakes, the cost to manage deer, voles, drought, uh, floods, replanting, uh, aftercare, uh, labor to plant. So all of these things since 2019 have grown exponentially. We have been able to pivot for voles. And believe it or not, do you all know what voles are? The little sort of shrew-like creatures? They will decimate a newly planted trees. And we've figured out ways around that. We've figured out ways around stampedes of deer and floods, et cetera, but we cannot control the rising costs of labor and the uh, materials to plant, mm -hmm. and we can't phase in our response to that. It's here, it's now, and we have to respond to it now. So we are deeply grateful to all of you for this legislation, for previous legislation, for speaking f for the trees and helping make sure that we can replant trees because we have to um, for climate change mitigation, for our communities, heat islands, et cetera. So thank you. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with you as we do more. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Ms. Street. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Deborah Street, and I'm a resident of Montgomery County on the east side in Colesville. I've been a volunteer at, organiz at an organization, Nature Forward, for nine years, and I'm here to represent Nature Forward. Nature Forward is the oldest independent environmental organization in the D.C. metro region. Its mission is to inspire residents of this region to appreciate, understand, and protect their natural environment through outdoor experience, education, and advocacy. The organization recognizes trees and forests as critical natural green infrastructure. Trees and forests purify our air and water, reduce urban heat, reduce stormwater runoff, serve as habitats for wildlife, reduce stress levels in people, and connect communities. On behalf of Nature Ford and its 28,000 members and supporters, we recommend approval of Bill 4023 to update the county's current tree and canopy fees while taking into consideration future inflation increases. This update will provide funds to more accurately align with the current cost of planting trees in the county in compliance with the required number of trees to be planted. This fee has not been raised in 10 years, and it's the time to raise the fee is now. We thank County Council President Glass and Council Member Friedson for introducing Bill 4023, and thank all the rest of the council members who have co-sponsored it. Earlier this year, we appreciate the Montgomery County Council unanimously approving the update of Forest Conservation Trees Bill, which expanded protection to priority forests, increased replanting ratios, and aligned with Maryland State's recent forest law updates. This was a significant step to align with the to align towards further protection of forests and trees in the county and was important to do in light of the findings in the Hughes Center report released last year. The report showed that Montgomery County and Prince George's County accounted for more than 44 percent of the state's total tree canopy loss due to development from 2013 to 2018. 
Voting for Bill 4023 will add further protection for the important natural green infrastructure in the county. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Street. Uh, and finally, Mr. Van Brandt. My name is Geert van Brandt. I represent the Baddock Burn Citizens Association in beautiful um, uh, Bethesda. It's very woodsy there, but we have builders coming in with bulldozers and taking down a whole acre of uh, trees and everything around so they can build a McMansion. Uh, you can imagine how long it takes uh, to uh, have trees grow back to, let's say, 50 year size. Uh, I myself um, uh, am not representing an association. I'm a private citizen. I take care of an arboretum of two acres in that neighborhood. And I plant up to 6,000 bulbs a year, and people in the neighborhood come and visit uh, those, but I plant many other things, so I keep planting, planting, planting. Um, and I'm very glad that the county at least takes uh, the roadside tree protection serious, because if the, if the county doesn't do it, uh, which builder will? So yes, the uh, 400 uh, plus uh, dollar per tree, and that would be a big tree, um, is, is totally justified, and I thank uh, the council for um, taking on this uh, initiative. Thank you, sir. Um, there are no other speakers for this public hearing, and thank you all for joining us in person. Good to see you, as always, and uh, this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on a resolution to approve or disapprove provisions of a memorandum of agreement between the county and the Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association. A joint public safety and government operations and fiscal policy committee work session is scheduled for January 22nd. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 15th. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on a resolution to approve Supplemental Appropriation 24-3 to the FY24 operating budget for the Montgomery County Government, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services, FY24 Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association contract in the amount of $336,188. The source of funds are the fire funds undesignated reserves. A joint public safety and government operations and fiscal policy committee work session is scheduled for January 22nd. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 15th. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Next item is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriations 2423 to the FY24 operating budget for the Montgomery County government, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service general personnel and operating costs in the amount of $616,400. The source of funds are undesignated fire fund reserves. A joint public safety and government operations and fiscal policy committee work session is scheduled for January 22nd. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on January 15th. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriations 24-32 to the FY24 operating budget to the Montgomery County Government's State's Attorney's Office, the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance Grant, FY23 body-worn camera policy, and implementation program to support law enforcement agencies, a competitive grant award in the amount of $948,103, and the source of funds is a federal grant. Council action is scheduled for December 5th. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. There are no speakers for this hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. The next item is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2431 to the FY24 operating budget for the Montgomery County Government, 
the Department of Police Bureau of Justice Assistance Grants Programs, FY23 Paul Coverdell Forensic Science Improvement Grants Program, a competitive grant award for the amount of $499,993, and the source of funds is a federal grant. A Public Safety Committee work session is scheduled for December 4th. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2436 to the FY24 Capital Budget for the Montgomery County Government, Office of the County Executive, Business Center Life Sciences and Technology Centers for the amount of $400,000, and the source of funds are Current Revenue General. A Joint Economic Development and Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session is scheduled for December 4th. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Next item is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 24-9 to the FY24 Operating Budget for the Montgomery County Government, the Department of Health and Human Services for the 988 Crisis Hotline Services in the amount of $960,000. The source of funds are a state grant. Council action is scheduled for December 5th. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. There are no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on Special Appropriation 23-39 to the FY24 Operating Budget for the Montgomery County Government, the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, Respite Center for Arriving Migrants Grants Program, uh, SAMU Foundation, uh, for the amount of $2,261,663, and the source of funds are undesignated reserves for the general fund. A joint government operations, public safety, and Health and Human Services Committee work session is scheduled for December 1st. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business today. Uh, there are four speakers for this item, uh, three of whom are in person, so I'd like to invite Frezia uh, Guzman, Nisus Gonzalez, and Jokvi Ferrer to come to the table. And I believe some of you will have translation services provided. Okay, very good. Okay, each of you have three minutes, and I'd like to invite Frezia Guzman. Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Fresia Guzman. I am the director of the Newcomers Case Management Program at Identity. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to pro provide testimony related to the special appropriation for the fiscal year 24 operating budget for the Respite Center for Arriving Immigrant Grant Program, SAMO Foundation. Identity's Newcomer Case Management Program has been working directly with SAMO Respite Center in Montgomery County since September 2022. SAMO has been a fundamental pillar in supporting the arrival of migrants to our county. They are the ones who have received individuals and family arriving to the area by buses and planes. Because of the Respite Center, newly arrived families have found a place to avoid sleeping on the streets. We are that identity have worked with many of the families who have been placed in SAMO, offering them case management service, including health finding houses. The respite centers buy us precious time that our case managers need to provide families with all of the service they needed while they are in a stable and safe environment. Identity also has the 
difficult task of supporting immigrant families who are homeless. On these occasions, we work with SAMO to find spaces today in the respite center. When they do not have availability, the cases get a lot more complicated. We must involve the book hotel rooms. Family then resist leaving the hotels, and the stabilization process gets severely interrupted and more costly. Identity fully supports the continuing funding of the respite center, providing a, sa a safe and welcoming temporary shelter for migrant families arriving in Montgomery County. It's fundamental and a big part of the avoid migrants in the street. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next is Ms. Gonzalez. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Nancy González. Quiero contarle cómo fue mi llegada al condado de Montgomery. Mi esposo, mis tres hijos y yo somos de Venezuela y llegamos a los Estados Unidos en agosto de este año. Nosotros decidimos venir a este país sin tener a nadie que nos ayude, a nadie que nos pueda ayudar. En Venezuela hay mucha violencia y injusticia y no queríamos que nuestros hijos crezcan en ese ambiente. Mi esposo fue amenazado por las pandillas. En Venezuela decidimos mudarnos a Colombia. Nosotros vivimos en Colombia por cuatro años. En Colombia agredieron físicamente a mi esposo para robarle la moto con la que él trabajaba. Lo acuchillaron en la cabeza. Luego que se recuperó sin tener otra opción, buscamos, una mejor, buscamos un mejor futuro. Nosotros decidimos venir a Estados Unidos. Estuvimos viajando eh, varias semanas. Pasamos por la selva del Darién y por Centroamérica. Luego llegamos a México. Estuvimos cinco meses esperando una cita en el sistema de la CBP-1 para poder entrar a los Estados Unidos. Desde México, en México estuvimos durmiendo en el piso, en un albergue. Los niños se me enfermaron de sarna. Un abogado nos ayudó a entrar a Estados Unidos como familia vulnerable. Luego de haber estado cinco meses esperando, cuando entramos a Estados Unidos, una señora nos pagó el transporte a San Antonio y desde ahí a San Antonio nos organizaron un pago. Un señor, eh, una organización nos pagó los pasajes en avión a Washington. A fines de agosto, al llegar a Washington, nosotros llamamos a, nos, a un número que nos habían dado y nos pidieron un taxi para llevarnos al SAMO. Ellos nos recibieron en el albergue. Allí estuvimos alrededor de 15 días en SAMO. Nos dieron comida, ropa y llevaron a mis hijos al médico. Ya que tenían sarna y mi hija estaba pasando una crisis de asma. Nos conectaron con Identity, que nos ayudó a encontrar un lugar donde vivir, comida, ropa y otros recursos y beneficios del condado. Ahora nosotros estamos rentando una habitación en Gaisterburg, donde pagamos renta a mis tres niños. Ya están atendiendo la escuela, están aprendiendo el inglés. Nuestro camino a los Estados Unidos no fue fácil, pero vemos un mejor, vemos un futuro mucho mejor aquí. Mi esposo estaba trabajando de carpintero por el clima que ahora está frío, ha bajado mucho el trabajo, así que estaba en búsqueda nuevamente, ya que los niños comenzaron la escuela y yo ahora también estoy en busca de empleo. Quiero dar las gracias a las personas de SAMO que trabajan con Identity y están ayudando a familias como nosotros por apoyarnos y guiarnos en este proceso que no ha sido nada fácil y estamos muy agradecidos con ellos por todo el apoyo que nos brindaron y nos siguen brindando cuando tenemos alguna duda. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon. I would like to share my experience. I am from Venezuela and I arrived to the United States in August of this year. Coming to the United States was uh, not easy. Um, from Venezuela, I moved to Colombia and from Colombia, uh, we traveled uh, through Central America, through Mexico, and, uh, in, and then uh, a lady paid for transportation so that I could come to Washington, D.C. Once I arrived in the DMV area, I was connected with our organization uh, uh, SAMU and they connected me with identity all of them have provided support um, and they were able to receive assistance from uh, both organizations that have helped us uh, get throughout this entire process we are extremely grateful for their support and guidance as they continue to assist us with any questions and concerns that we uh, may have i would like for all of you to continue your support to the uh, uh, samu organization and to identity they gave me they have provided shelter for me uh, samu for me and my family for my husband 
and I am uh, very grateful for the support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Jerk Ivy Ferrer. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es eh, Jerk Ivy Ferrer. Eh, yo estoy aquí básicamente desde mi experiencia como migrante. Eh, soy ciudadano venezolano. Eh, llegué aquí el 28 de agosto del año pasado y pues tuve una experiencia bastante dificultosa en el viaje y pues cuando llegué aquí a Estados Unidos, eh, a um, Texas, básicamente pues me enviaron a Washington y ahí me recibió la organización SAMO. Desde ese momento que llegué a la organización pues nos dieron eh, cobija, principalmente teníamos frío, eh, nos dieron comida, nos, eh, nos dieron mucho apoyo en cuanto a, a salud, porque pues po tengo co una condición de salud, ellos me diligenciaron todo el proceso. no Básicamente fueron 15 días que pues eh, me insertaron como en la sociedad de manera formal, eh, ¿sí? Y pues... Eh, en un momento pues vieron la oportunidad, eh, como la habilidad que tenía yo básicamente para dictar clases de inglés, eh, empecé a hacer voluntariados con ellos eh, y pues desde la experiencia que tuve en el shelter donde ellos me, me enviaron, pues ahí empezamos a tener comunicación y para que todas las personas quienes venían llegando de principio, pues poderlos insertar en el shelter, des, eh, saber qué, qué hacer en ese momento y pues eh, estoy aquí principalmente porque me gustaría mucho que se les apoye eh, a la organización SAMU para que puedan se, continuar con, con su servicio porque creo yo que así como me, me, me pude insertar en la sociedad, creo que también eh, para muchos que vienen llegando puedan eh, tener ese, un, un, esa, ese, ese apoyo básicamente como lo tuve yo. Gracias. Uh, good afternoon, my name is uh, Joeski Gonzalez and I am here to speak on behalf of the organization SAMU. I would like for you all to continue providing support to this organization. They have helped me as an immigrant in this country. I came to the United States with my partner and the organization SAMU uh, has helped us with shelter, attention, uh, food and support. During my arrival uh, since uh, August of last year, they took me to the shelter so that I could stay here in the United States. And the organization has also used my abilities to uh, teach English and use those tools uh, to help newcomers. And I would like for you all to continue supporting this organization because they will continue helping others as much as they have helped me. Thank you. Thank you, gracias. Um, we have, uh, yep, yeah, Councilmember Rank. We have one more person who's virtual. If you want to, unless you want to comment now. Okay. Uh, joining us uh, virtually is Sister uh, Charlotte Wagner. Sister Wagner, are you with us? Yes. Thank you. There. You go. Good afternoon. I'm the executive director of the Newcomer Network at Catholic Charities. Um, Catholic Charities was the first organization to begin meeting the buses when they arrived and we provide immigration legal services and case management services to immigrants. And one of the sites at which we provide those case management services is the SAMU Respite Center. The county's Migrant Respite Center was started in response to an immediate need and it's an example of what can be accomplished when government and nonprofits join efforts. Thanks to the county's Bienvenidos program, we had already built partnerships between county government and nonprofits when the buses from Texas began arriving. We were already well situated to step up together to meet the need. Working together, we were able to organize the county's reception of migrants, and working together, we were able to avoid the chaos that has occurred in some jurisdictions. As case managers for residents of the center, Catholic Charities sees firsthand each day how critical continued operation of the SAMU Respite Center really is. Guests at the Respite Center are primarily asylum seekers who have fled their homeland. They arrive exhausted, bewildered, and fearful. The center provides an opportunity to breathe, to get their thoughts together, and to make decisions about their future. The Respite Center houses families with children. The simple fact is that if the Respite Center closes, we will have more families living on the street. 
A family living on the street is a tragedy at any time, but particularly so as we enter the coldest part of the year. Some may think these migrants could just go to existing county shelters. Our case managers are consistently told that the shelters are full or that our clients don't qualify to live in the shelter. Even if shelter spaces were available, the shelters are not equipped to meet the unique needs of this population. We consistently see that a top worry on the minds of newcomers as they arrive at the respite center is how to comply with all immigration law requirements. Respite center staff and caseworkers help them in understanding the requirements, getting them to their immigration appointments, and connecting them with immigration lawyers. In, additional, in addition, the SAMU respite center staff are bilingual, and they understand the cultures and the journeys the families have been through. I see the respite center as an investment. It is basic, there are no luxuries, but it provides critical services to a group of people who find themselves in a very difficult place right now. They are vulnerable for now, and they need help for now. While some move on to other jurisdictions, others remain in the county. They're eager to work and eager to become full contributing members of the community, and they do have a great deal co to contribute. The respite center gives them a temporary safe space, and our case management gives them the help they need as they learn to navigate their new home. I respectfully ask that the special appropriation be approved so that these critical services in our county may continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister, for your work and for uh, providing testimony this afternoon. Uh, Councilmember Mink. Uh, thank you. I'll be quick. Um, my Spanish is really bad, but I'm going to try. Um, mi español es muy malo, pero lo voy a intentar. Solo quiero decirles a nuestros inmigrantes recientes que estamos muy felices de tenerlos aquí en nuestra comunidad y muchas gracias por uh, participar ya en nuestro gobierno local. Sus voces son muy importantes. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Councilmember Mick. Thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. Uh, there are no more uh, people signed up to testify, so we appreciate you for being, being here. Uh, and this public hearing is now closed. Next item is a public hearing on Special Appropriation 23-37 for the FY24 Operating Budget for the Montgomery County Government, Office of Food Systems Resilience, and the Department of Health and Human Services Food Security Initiative for the amount of $11,060,000, and the source of funds are general undesignated reserves, uh, and an amendment to the FY24 Operating Budget Resolution 20-184, Section G, for the fiscal year 24 designation of entity, entities for non-competitive contract award. And the status is the Capital Area Food Bank Incorporated. A Joint Government Operations and Fiscal Policy and Health and Human Services Committee work session is scheduled for December 1st. Those wishing to submit testimony for the Council's consideration should do so uh, before the close of business today. And we have four speakers. Uh, who would like to share their thoughts on these items, uh, three of whom are in person. So I'd like to invite down Masa Krasal, Barbara Gutterman, and Bob Shalas to the table. And Ms. Crisal. Good afternoon. My name is Massa Cressel, and I am the Interim Executive Director of the Montgomery County Food Council. Thank you, County Council members, for giving me the opportunity to provide a statement today. As many of you know, the Food Council serves as the primary connection point for businesses, nonprofits, government agencies, and residents around food system issues in our county. We submitted written testimony in support of this special appropriation in addition to my statement today. I will not read directly from that testimony, but want to emphasize a few key points for your consideration. 
Uh, food security is an issue the Food Council knows well. Not only were we contracted by the county to create the strategic plan to end childhood hunger in partnership with key government agencies, community stakeholders, and residents, but we also created Montgomery County's food security plan in 2017. We convene food assistance providers monthly and are a state-supported community benefit organization for SNAP outreach and enrollment. We do this work every day. The approval of this special appropriation will enable two key benefits. It will support the continuation of the food staples program at a time of heightened food access needs across our county. And it will simultaneously test innovative recommendations from the strategic plan to end childhood hunger. It is vital that both of these investments are made and that they are made now. The food staples program was only allotted funding for half of the fiscal year and the food assistance needs in our community have never been higher. Simultaneously, we need to shift our strategy toward innovative, targeted investments that support the communities who need it the most, while also leveraging additional institutional investments. The recommendations contained in the strategic plan to end childhood hunger at, are aimed at those longer term goals, but we need to test and evaluate these potential systemic solutions. The sooner we know what works, the more targeted future uh, county investment can be to improve our food system for all county residents. We appreciate your partnership with this work. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Ms. Gutterman. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. I'm Barbara Gutterman. I've been a resident of Montgomery County for the last 26 years. I learned about So What Else from a Montgomery County resident and wanted to see firsthand what the organization was all about. So last year, before Thanksgiving, my son and I decided to go to the walk-up pantry in Gaithersburg. As we drove into the parking lot, I instantly found my heart in my stomach and immediately started to cry. My son asked, Mom, why are you crying? And I said, look, look at all these hundreds and hundreds of people in long lines wrapping around the parking lot in 30 degree temperatures just to get food for their families. I'm crying because all these people are going hungry right here in Montgomery County. It was eye-opening and heartbreaking, and that's why I have become involved. As I continued to volunteer, I often spoke to individuals in those lines who have been shocked and humbled by the need to ask for food assistance. Most of them are working multiple jobs, trying to make ends meet, and despite that, they consistently need food from so what else. Many expressed having to make the choice between gas or heat and food. Even as the pandemic waned, inflation has soared and things have only gotten worse. It was clear that there were so many people who needed help, so my husband and I organized a fundraiser to bridge the gap. And although successful, private donors can only do so much. We are concerned that the county has not provided adequate support and funding to sustain So What Else's operation. These are our neighbors, but these are your residents. We need your handshake and partnership to feed this community. So What Else has become the largest provider of food resources in the county, so our constituency of taxpayers cannot comprehend the holdup and critical funding needed to support them. I have seen their operation with my own eyes, and I have not turned away, and neither should you. I had to verify the numbers So What Else published because they are truly hard to believe, but I can unfortunately attest that the statistics are factually correct. I urge you please to work in partnership with our committed donors to do your part. Families in Montgomery County will continue to go hungry without your financial support for the rising demands facing So What Else and the thousands of residents it feeds. We cannot turn away. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for your service to our community. Mr. Shalas. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak today with you. My name is Bob Schles and I'm one of the co-founders of So What Else and we're Montgomery County based not-for-profit that provides food and basic necessities to the underprivileged in the DC area. And today we have a budget of over three million dollars for fiscal year 24 and are relying on our private donors and foundations to survive. By all accounts today, we're the largest food provider in the county. We work seven days a week and travel outside the county to pick up food if necessary. Thus, if someone reaches out to us in need 
of food, we are there for them. Hence, in late 2021, Montgomery County came to us and asked if we could assist and feed eight Montgomery food hubs, and we gladly said yes, and we have not stopped serving. However, in 2022, after going through the grant process, we did not receive any funding. It came down to an administrative error. We received an appropriation for fiscal year 23 in the amount of 130000 Since this was not a community grant, we were ineligible for bridge funding for fiscal year 24. In the spring of this year, we were told that the $6 million budget from the county regarding food insecurity would go to MANA and Capital Area Food Bank to be distributed via a formula. We ultimately received $20,000, which in turn had to be used to purchase food from Capital Area Food Bank. Uh, we had a new pantry location, I have a new pantry location in North Bethesda, which is an additional $11,000 a month after Lake Forest Mall closed down, which is our former um, headquarters. I'm an accountant by trade, a CPA, and I'm just going to let the numbers speak for themselves. Using the most recent numbers, quarter three, we did 2.4 million pounds of food or equal to 779,000 pounds of food per month for Montgomery County. The cost to us to deliver, rescue this food, which includes various expenses, equates to 16 cents a pound. It costs so it else 125000 a month, or $1.5 million a year, just for Montgomery County operations, as Barbara said, to feed our residents. I'm a resident, and my co-founder is a resident as well. Here are some key metrics for the county. So it else serves 22,000 individuals a month who walk up between one of our two pantries at Wyaconda or at Wednesdays at the Lake Forest Mall parking lot. This service happens to be on the verge of being cut off due to lack of funding. Since the start of the pandemic, we've rescued 60 million pounds of food. We've, so it also has used collaboration and partnerships to pick up food from the likes of Whole Foods, FarmLink, Food Rescue US, Costco, and many more. Mr. Schles, if you, your time's up, if you could wrap up. Yep. We're on pace to rescue $9 million this year at a cost of $0.16. Cents. We're asking solely for $360,000. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the three of you for providing in-person testimony. We have one person who's joining us virtually, and that is Roberto Malera. Hello. Good afternoon. Members of the Council, my name is Roberto Melara. I'm the Director of the Maryland Region at the Capri Area Food Bank. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. I will be brief, but I would like to take this opportunity to share some details about our work with the county and thank the Council and county staff for our going partnership to the food staple program. As some of you might know, at the Capri Area Food Bank, we serve the counties and jurisdiction of the D.C. metro region, including Montgomery and Prince George's counties in Maryland. Each year, we work with more than 400 partners to ensure that our neighbors in the DMV have access to the food they need today to build brighter futures tomorrow. During our last fiscal year, we worked with 140 partners organizations to distribute more than 50 million meals in Montgomery County through a variety of programs and, and methods including the food stable program. This represented a 60% increase over prior fiscal year. And together with the members of Montgomery County community, we work to ensure food continue to be available to neighbors in the face of the ongoing effects of the pandemic. And the end of federal support like emergency SNAP allotments that expire early this year. Since July 1st, the Food Stable Program has allowed us to distribute nearly 2 million pounds of food to partner agencies across Montgomery County, including more than 950,000 pounds of fresh produce. Because we continue to encounter our ongoing need, we know that the effects of the pandemic have not ended, even if those effects are no longer always in the spotlight. So I also want to take this opportunity to applaud the county's commitment to ending childhood hunger and the recent release of your comprehensive plan. Many of the report's data points, particularly 
those around the level of need in the county align with what we have seen in our own hunger report we released earlier this year. The Food Bank Hunger Report found that nearly half of individuals experienced food insecurity in our region did not access free food assistance to a provider in their community in the prior year. So it's exciting to see that the county plan includes strategies designed to improve the efficacy of food distribution networks and recommendations for building up of government programs that we already know are effective. The Capital Food Bank looks forward to working together to support this and other efforts outlined in the plan. Once again, we sincerely appreciate the Council, the Office of the County Executive, the Office of Food System Resiliency, and the staff and partners across the county who continue to put resources into the Food Stable Program and efforts to address hunger more broadly. And we look forward to a continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Malara. Uh, thank you all for your testimony uh, and to your, uh, to your service in this particular area. Uh, there are no more speakers for this item, so this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriations 24-29 to the FY24 Operating Budget for the Montgomery County Government, Department of Health and Human Services, Strengthening Maryland's Public Health Infrastructure in the amount of $430,238, and the source of funds are a state grant. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. Uh, there are no speakers for this hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve this supplemental? So Moved by Councilmember Fani Gonzalez, seconded by Councilmember Lutke. Uh, all those in favor of this supplemental? And that is, a pr uh, that is unanimous by all those present. Thank you. Next is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2427 to the FY24 Operating Budget for the Montgomery County Public Schools, reducing over-identification in special education grants for the amount of $1 million, and the source of funds are state, is a state grant. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion to approve the supplemental? So moved. Moved by Councilmember Jawando. Second. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Balcom. All those in favor? And that is unanimous by all those present. And the final public hearing today is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2428 to the FY24 operating budget for the Montgomery County Public Schools Stronger Connections Grant for the amount of $3 million, and the source of funds is a state grant. Council action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this hearing, so this hearing is now closed. Before I ask for a motion, uh, I'm going to call on Vice President Friedson. So, Ms. Bianfield, if you submitted your testimony, we do have your testimony. I, 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 come on up for one minute, Ms. Bianfield. We appreciate you writing in. Um, thank you. I'm Dr. Paula Bienenfeld. I'm the lead for the uh, Montgomery County Jewish Parents Coalition, and we did send some uh, testimony yesterday when we found out about this. We're just asking for a brief pause on the $3 million, particularly the section on committing hate, because as you know, um, it does not include anti-Semitism. And we really strongly feel, and I'm sure many of you do, or all of you do, that anti-Semitism should be included in any funds that go toward a program on committing hate. I just want to say one thing, which was our members um, found something new from uh, um, Montgomery Blair High School that was on Instagram on November 17th for 24 hours and allegedly is no longer there. It's a school approved organization, Blazers for Human Rights, and this is what they posted. Israel is skinning the bodies of killed Palestinians. What does it use their skins for? So I would just really 
implore you to please, please consider this committing hate section and put a pause on it and make sure that anti-Semitism is integrated into the anti-racist, anti-bias programs and training modules. And again, I thank you and I am so sorry for sort of barging in. Thanks no. to all of you. Uh, thank, thank you for uh, articulating uh, what was written uh, in, in the testimony to us. Uh, it was mentioned earlier today when we approved additional funding uh, for the security grants that later tonight will be the final meeting of the Anti-Hate Task Force and every group has talked about MCPS and working collaboratively with MCPS to ensure uh, that uh, that uh, every student is able to, to study uh, and uh, be f in an environment free of hate. A number of my colleagues want to speak on this item. I'll turn it over to Vice President Friesen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the committee for taking this up. I, I'm wondering, uh, do we have council staff and representatives from MCPS here? Join us. Great. Uh, prior to that testimony, I had a couple questions uh, on this, uh, specifically on the um, combating hate and the parent and caregiver uh, engagement. Um, we heard from testimony just now, we've heard quite a bit more testimony, not just on uh, anti-Semitism, but also on Islamophobia. Could you just speak to this grant? It's a state grant, it's not county funds, but it is a state grant. You've applied for it. It has a scope of work that was discussed in committee. Just hoping if we could get clarification on uh, what is included specifically uh, in the combating hate, and if you could talk a little bit about the parent and caregiver engagement as well, and specifically related to the forms of hate and special attention in the moment that we're in, of course, uh, to Islamophobia and anti-Semitism specifically, if you would. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start us off. Um, so it is a $3 million grant addressing three areas. Oh, introduce yourself. Robert Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance from Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, those three areas are cyber safety, uh, uh, um, parent caregiver engagement, as well as combating hate. Um, and I just want to uh, recognize that the purpose of this um, Stronger Connection grant is to increase school systems capacity to provide all students with safe, inclusive, and supportive learning environments. Um, Mr. Monteleon is here to, to speak about yeah, th and thank you for this opportunity. And um, I would really like to address some of the, the information, I guess, that is out there that the work of combating anti-Semitism would not be part of this grant. It absolutely is integral and central to uh, the work that we would be doing uh, as a result of, of receiving this funding. Um, just a, a, a couple of pieces, and I, I will certainly speak to that. We have been engaging with a variety of community advocacy groups, leadership organizations, and parents and communities at schools since I came onto this role in July of 2021, since last fall. Uh, and ongoing work and ongoing re regular meetings um, and, and getting input and feedback uh, from a macro standpoint across the district as well as for individual schools. Um, we remain committed to combating hate and bias in all of its forms, and we clearly recognize the significance of the moment that we are in right now. Um, that is a global moment, but it clearly has local implications and impact on our students and our families. Um, so just to, to uh, rewind a little bit, in April of 2023 last year, Dr. McKnight uh, went before a, uh, uh, the schools and, and community leaders at Rockville High School, and, and she said specifically, we will be tightly coordinated to prevent, respond to incidents of hate bias, diluting the responsibility, and this is key, diluting the responsibility leaves too much to chance, she said. We will identify key experts in equity, cultural proficiency, and non-discrimination to respond to incidents. So. This is to combat all forms of hate, not solely anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. And we do have experts in equity, cultural proficiency, and non-discrimination. The difference between what we have currently been doing and what we intend to do with this funding is to centralize our efforts. 
Right now, the work does cut across multiple offices, uh, mine and school support and well-being, as well as our safety and security folks, as well as our equity folks who are with strategic initiatives. Um, and so this grant provides us with the flexibility, one key piece, and I could go th all through each of the pillars, um, but one key piece is to fund a position who would coordinate the work that we do with our community partners to fully understand the stories of each part of our diverse community. It was mentioned earlier uh, today at this, at this uh, meeting that we are one of the most diverse uh, counties in the country. We certainly are. Our schools reflect that. And it's incumbent upon us to dedicate a position and a team of folks to understanding the differences of each of the different communities we have, their experiences historically and right now. Um, and how we can support our students in schools. Whether these are incidents that are occurring in schools or these are things that are happening in the world that are bleeding into our communities and into our schools. So there's a number of things, um, and this does not, well, I'll just quickly list them. We, we, we are doing a, much of this already, but this includes professional development for staff, all the way from uh, building administrators, central office support, down to classroom teachers and paraeducators, um, ongoing student lessons and activities, including uh, the culture of respect that we're doing now, which is man mandatory for all students in MCPS this year, which is specifically on hate, bias, and bullying. The community uh, uh, engagement, um, with local schools as well as with uh, community groups. The communication, right? How we're communicating, in what languages, the ease of access to the forms, where to find information. Um, also, uh, preventative school culture building, and then on uh, ongoing real-time data monitoring, which we have also instituted this, this year, a series of structures and processes. And that data monitoring allows us to respond in real time as we see an influx in, act, in, in incidents in schools. So I just want to be very clear, yes, it absolutely does include work for anti-Semitism, in addition to Islamophobia, in addition to racism and anti-blackness, or uh, uh, anti-Hispanic Latino community, or our newcomers, all of the above, LGBTQ+, everything. Um, and so I just want to be very clear on that. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, well I appreciate you clarifying that. I think it's very important. I would recommend that that information be shared in a much better way moving forward. I will note that the information that was shared with the committee and the information that was shared with the council was effectively indeterminate and that's not enough. And obviously at this moment where people are deeply concerned and afraid and there are real legitimate questions about cultural competency, about training of teachers and administrators, on, you know, particularly on these issues as they have reached a flashpoint, both in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We have heard repeated concerns from parents and from community members about alarming episodes that don't just involve children, that involve educators who just don't know what they're doing and need support of the central administrative office to back them up, to train them, to help them. And so I, I, I hope that you will lean into that. I know there's a commitment uh, you know, that, that, you know, in order to do that, but it needs to be communicated, it needs to be implemented. And I just think that's really important. Uh, there is a position on, uh, in, involved in this, as you mentioned. I just will, will note, this is state funds, but eventually the state funds run out. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to make a decision of whether or not we're going to fund it in a subsequent fiscal year. I know there's a state grant that can get extended, I believe, until 2026 based on, uh, on the materials. H how are we going to determine success in this program? I mean, obviously, combating hate is a very challenging thing to do. So, you know, at, at the end of this, whether you extend the grant or not, when the decision point comes before the Board of Education to make a request and ultimately the council to decide uh, on that request, what are, what are the metrics, what are we looking at, you know, what is the reporting going to, to be uh, in order to make that decision at that point? Yeah, absolutely. Like all of these, these, these areas where we have engaged in deep work, similar to the work that we've done for, with academics for a long time, it's about the data. So in this case, it's hate and bias, but it's also bullying or attendance or discipline or suspension of uh, disproportionately for students of color. And when we, we, we assess the impact of the staff that we have to do this work and support schools, it's based on a reduction, right, of those incidents. Um, and we've seen in two of the other areas I mentioned some growth so far this year. 
we have not seen a reduction in hate bias this year. And so the anecdotes and the information that you all are receiving is real and based on numbers. So we, are, we monitor these, these data weekly. Every Friday we, we report out and act um, at the associate and the executive level uh, with our school supervisors. So we will continue to monitor that. And, and as we continue to see, and really I think it's breaking it down further beyond just incidents of hate bias in schools and looking at some of the things, frankly, that you just mentioned, um, where we may have folks in, in schools who are unaware, uneducated, or uh, perhaps ignorant in terms of what they are saying and how that is landing with, with segments of our student population. But it's all about data, sir. Well, I appreciate it. And one person is not going to be able to train the entire school system, and it is needed across the board. I will tell you from what we are hearing, from the incidents that are occurring, it is very broad. So I would just very strongly encourage that you continue to use and really double down on expert partners in the community who are desperately looking to support the school system, who realize and recognize how important the school system is to addressing these issues, there are experts in anti-Semitism, there are experts in Islamophobia, there are experts in anti-black racism, there's experts in targeting of immigrants. Use them. Please use them because one person is not going to be able to realistically uh, address this. I, I would, uh, I'm, I'm happy to support this. I'm glad that anti-Semitism and Islamophobia specifically are included in it. They should not be the only forms of hate that are part of it, but they should not be excluded from uh, this work, but I do think that we should get regular reporting, and I know this was uh, you know, discussed a bit uh, in committee, so that we're not waiting until the request comes before us. Of course you're going to want the money uh, you know, a year and a half or two years from now, but I think it would be helpful for us to get a sense before you're requesting the money of how this is working, what schools is it specifically in, what are the benefits that we're seeing, how are you addressing you know, these various uh, issues. Uh, you know, so that we're not confronted with that at the point at which we're making a financial decision, but along the way, and whether the committee, uh, Education and Culture Committee, is the appropriate venue for that, or submitting to the full council, then the, the, the committee uh, could take it up. I yield to the chair uh, on that and making that determination, but I think having the reporting, uh, you know, is, is, is going to be important. With that, I'll, I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice President Fritz, and also, uh, Mr. Monteleon, thank you for your, your service on the Anti-Hate Task Force, um, uh, uh, representing MCPS and the superintendent on that work. I'll turn it over to the Chair of the Education Committee, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you all showing up. I appreciate Councilman Fritzen's uh, and other colleagues' interests. Just wanted to give a little context. Uh, you know, we did go into one of the things that we brought up was we love allocating state money, but we want to know what uh, the plan is in, 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 in both in both these items, not just this item, but the item before on ad over identification of students in special education. There was not a ton of information included in the packet, so we dealt we delved into that a little bit in the committee. Uh, obviously, both really important goals, but it was very clear that uh, the three components of this: cyber safety for students and teachers and families, community community members, training and support for students uh, regarding. Uh, hate bias and training volunteers and parents and caregivers in positive youth development programs like mental health, first aid, and the like. Uh, we, we got into that a little more, and we did ask for, and you committed to, uh, uh, coming back to committee and giving updates on how this is going. And, and, we, and I think that is important, especially right now. Uh, I do want to commend uh, the school system. You know, it's always, you can always do more collaboration, but, you know, I. I go back to the pandemic. I, I remember I did. We did a uh, discussion on anti-blackness with Dr. Ibram Kendi with young students. Uh, this is three years ago, when when anti-Semitism continued to rise. You all engaged in curriculum changes at the school board again, which is the school board's responsibility with the system, uh, and engaged partners on those dialogues. Uh, and so, th there's always more to do. Uh, but I do, I, I do commend you for the work that has been done. Um, and, and I think uh, last thing I'll say here is, uh, and I mentioned this in committee as well, advance the budget conversations. We want to know, uh, and we're going to delve into this in committee. We have a committee session coming up on the anti-racist audit and other programs. So we're going to go into this more in depth in the, next, in the coming weeks. 
But we want to know what your plan is for short, medium, and long term to address the panoply of challenges. Are we have a crisis? Youth mental health, uh, in in our truancy, which we took up in cyber safety, certainly in hate and bias. Uh, there, our children are crying out to us. So it's, and I know you know that, but I think that just necessitates more communication, more partnership, not just with us, but with the community members. And I know you're working on it, and I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Uh, but I appreciate colleagues bringing it up, but I want everyone to know we're focused on that on the committee. Yeah, a absolutely. I, I want, so I want to thank you all. Right, I've, I've been before this, this body and then also certainly the Education Culture Committee multiple times. Truancy, uh, suspension, school to prison pipeline. We'll be back on Thursday for our restorative approaches and the data there. <laughs> Um, and just be straight up, right? We're not, the, the data that we're looking at now, right, in, in public school systems, certainly in Montgomery County, is not the traditional data that schools have looked at. It's not just lit scores and math scores, although that is our core purpose. Um, and so we, can, we are monitoring this in real time. We are in a constant plan, do, study, act process. Uh, and we're ha always happy to come back and share. And I would just like to say we, we recognize that just hiring somebody is not the panacea or the lightning bolt that is going to solve this. But the purpose of having one person uh, have this as their sole responsibility is right now the work lives in multiple offices that have a lot of things under their roofs. And this is an opportunity for that person to, to uh, create cohesion for the professional development that's going on, both from our internal leaders as well as the community partners. I've been in these professional development sessions with the community partners who are advocating to be in spaces with us to, to share that cultural and historical perspective. So it is happening, um, and I appreciate the support, and we'll continue to work uh, with you and with our community partners to support our kids. Thank you, and uh, Mr. President, I, uh, our councilman for a day has a, a thought. Uh, sure. So please yield. Yeah, I have a quick question. So I know you mentioned that there are going to be individuals in schools, um, you know, that are going to be training educators on how to be, you know, culturally and racially sensitive. But I was just wondering the process for how these individuals are going to be selected and trained. Because if there's, you know, an issue for that educators are already, you know, currently, um, some educators are currently not, you know, culturally and racially sensitive. How is that process and training going to change when it comes to the individuals who are going to be in the schools and, and then teaching the educators? So there's really, um, it's not like we, ide I, I appreciate the question, right? It's a 14th largest school district, 161,000 kids, 211 schools. So how do you identify who to train? There's macro learning that everybody gets. And then there's individualized micro learning that is specific to the school communities. So for example, uh, hate bias issues uh, may look different at a Whitman or a Wooten or a BCC than they may at say a Paint Branch, right, or a Seneca Valley. Our community is just different. Um, and so we have to respond to the individual needs of schools. And for the first time, in alignment with the, the comment I made about data earlier, Every single school has a well-being goal and a climate goal as part of their school improvement plans. So if, we're, if they have a goal and it's database, so there's two different ways. We provide the training macro, but schools that are looking at these issues, and there are many of them that have elevated it, whether they volunteer to elevate it or their school supervisor nudged them to elevate it, they then are receiving specific training for their specific school or their specific teachers. I can, I, I can tell you right now, we are going out to a school in the next couple of weeks that is seeing a specific issue and a specific grade level, and it's very micro. It's not the whole school, it's X grade, right? So that the teachers on that grade level team are receiving very specific micro learning because of an incident. But that does not preclude us from providing proactive, preventative macro learning for all staff across the district um, prior to then looking at that data or responding to those incidents. Hope that makes sense. Thank you, and Miss and Council Member for a day. Uh, Epe Binu is from Seneca Valley, so you, I don't know if you knew that, but you got it right. So I yield back. Ms. I, I did not know that, but um, congratulations. Uh, fantastic comments. Thank you very much, Council Member Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that when we're talking about issues that are bullying related, and, and you and I and, and Council Member Friedson, we talked about 
changes that needed to be made to the, the reporting system or the triaging of the way bullying complaints were handled because hate bias and hate crimes incidents are a separate and distinct thing under state law um, and to be treated and handled differently for exactly the reason you all were suggesting, which is when you know that something is flaring up and they are hate bias related incidents, it's a strong indicator that that is a situation or an area ripe for hate crimes to then occur and cross that threshold, which we want to address proactively rather than after an incident has happened. And so I'm just wanting to be clear because we've talked about specific types of hate, but that under state law, that includes criminal acts that are based on someone's race, color, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, disability, national origin, or because another person or group is homeless. And that all of those, all of those categories are included in the work that you will be doing that relates to bullying, intimidation, and harassment that may be based on these bias motives against those protected classes. Is that correct? That is correct, and I don't have it before me, but I believe if we were to look at our, our board um, policy on this, uh, there is a statement at the very top which, which uh, highlights every single one of the groups that, that you mentioned. I think key to your point, right, we can have a fight in a school, we can have bullying in a school, we can have graffiti or vandalism mm -hmm. in a school, but it, if it's caused by hate, or the motive for it was hate or racism or bias or what have you, then it crosses into a different threshold. Similar to the federal hate crime statutes. There's a crime, and then there's something intent makes right. it a hate crime. So we have revised, we have two separate forms and processes for bullying and for a hate bias incident, and that is uh, relatively new over the last, I want to say, 13, 14, uh, maybe year and a half. Um, and, and just to be clear, it's, our laws are different than the federal laws because the, it, uh, we adapted state law to say in whole or substantial part based on those factors, not just it, the feds don't have an equivalent of substantial part in, their, in the federal laws and, and there are a lot of other hiccups and hurdles that need to be used um, in order to deploy those. We also have a law that requires that, that allows you to charge criminally for um, using a, a fixing or placing a symbol of hate, which sometimes is graffiti based, sometimes is a physical object, and that's important. Um, but I, I, one of the things that I find um, interesting that certainly the cyber safety piece of what this funding is to go for, some of the, how do I say, some of the, the things that happen on the internet that take a person down a rabbit hole are aimed at teenagers. Um, and they are aimed at recruiting uh, people uh, under hate bias motives to engage in specific conduct. That's frightening. And that is something that certainly I hope is being taught and will be taught in terms of cyber safety and cyber hygiene for our students because teenagers are incredibly vulnerable for that. And while current events have us focused on some very, very significant and things that have been escalating prior to the terrorist attacks of October 7th, because historically they have always been up there, um, and even more so in, in the past few years. One of the things that I have found in doing that work in the past in my prior career was that folks ideology shop. So what might be your hate motive today, it's a different group or a different thing tomorrow, but the hate is consistent because they're going to keep at it. So undergirding all of this, undergirding everything you're doing to teach and be culturally appropriate and to teach the distinctions, the many nuanced distinctions to my colleagues' credits in raising that and the importance of making sure that no one person can teach all of this, um, is the notion that that it may not be just one thing. It may be multiple, and all of it, all of it needs to be addressed. Um, with respect to the bullying, intimidation, and harassment report, I know the one for 2022-2023 academic year is not available yet at the state. It won't be available until March. Um, and I know that in, if you look at the comparative charts on that for the past few years, the county took a dip in per, it's expressed as per 1,000 incidents per 1,000. Um, but 
it also came to my attention in my prior work that school systems were not always reporting all bullying, harassment, and intimidation incidents. They were only reporting those where a student or their parent or guardian filled out the physical bullying, harassment, and intimidation form. And particularly here in the county and in meeting with certain groups from different cultures and different backgrounds, that was not something that they were as familiar with, with utilizing that form, or that or that their issue or their complaint or concern may be treated differently or not documented, if you will, in that way if they didn't actually fill out that specific form. So my ask is that as, as we all, we collectively work towards improving the climate, not just within our communities, but in our microcosm communities in our schools, that we document all of those, whether that actual physical bullying, harassment, and intimidation form is filled out directly by a parent, guardian, or student, or whether a staff member completes it after receiving an email or having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a student who's, had, who's experienced that kind of an incident. Thank you. May, may, I, may I respond to the last, the last point? So it doesn't matter whether a parent right, or a student fills out that form. If information gets to a staff member, form or no form, the staff member must fill out that form for our documentation. That feeds into our student information system, and then we use that data to report out to MSDE. So um, again, so when it, there was a, a, tr a training for all administrators in August. We had another one on November 17th. We have a series of professional uh, learning mandatory uh, trainings for our school-based administrators on all the above that I've, we're talking about here today and more. Um, and that is was absolutely a key component of what we train people on in August. I was part of that training and led that training. So. Again, if we need to track down where are parents reporting something, not filling out the form, and then no, no action is taken, then we need to really then go school by school because that is absolutely what is expected to happen, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Council Member Stewart. Um, thank you. Uh, Council Member Effie Binu actually um, asked a very similar question that I was going to ask. Um, regarding um, the schools and thank you for breaking that down about how you're looking at um, specific schools uh, uh, because I do think as you mentioned each of our schools are, are different and what they're going to need in terms of training and um, with their educators their parents um, their student body is going to need to be tailored uh, I guess the thing I want to underscore here is the need to be communicating that with the community um, I know we have a large um, county, a large school system, but I want to echo what Council Member Friedson said. Even before October 7th and since then, we have a school community, we have school children and parents, some of who are, are very afraid. Very afraid. Um, I've been on numerous Zooms with parents um, and families who want to know what we're doing for them. And this is in the short term and the long term. And what I'm hearing is that you all have a plan, you know, $3 million sounds like a lot of money. It's going to be spent pretty quickly, I know. Um, and you're moving forward with this. But I don't think the message is getting to our families. And that's critical for this to be a success and for us to work towards this. And so uh, I'm very glad you're here. I appreciate the questions from uh, my colleagues um, and look forward to continuing this conversation um, with the Chair of uh, Education and Culture. But I would just stress, we, we, we need to get to our families um, and, our, and the children uh, and our students. Thank you. Council Member Sales. Uh, can I, I just make one oh, note, sorry. just one note. It's a $3 million grant for all three parts. I just want to be clear that the council knows it's 870856 specifically for the combating hate bias part. I just want to make sure that's part of the record. Thank you for that. Um, I agree with all the sentiments shared by my colleagues. I just had concerns about the breakdown of salaries. Um, just to be sure that I'm understanding this correctly, that there will be five 
staff members committed to doing to I guess executing all of this work and we'll get a, a work plan or an update of what that um, work plan will consist of and how many students are being impacted yeah, so the five are stri strictly related to the cybersecurity portion. Okay. Uh, the other two uh, activities are going to be handled by uh, TPT, um, part-time um, uh, coordinators. Is what's yeah, in I'm just grant. curious about what that what those roles entail for the cybersecurity job because I'm looking at two million dollars, um, a majority of the grant going towards those five positions. Um, and just curious what they will be responsible for breaking that down about four hundred thousand okay. dollars So um, I'll have to I, it's, I'm not the the technology office okay. and we were we were before I think um, a committee a couple weeks ago and uh, Director Chuck McGee who does all of our uh, IT infrastructure was speaking to that so I don't want to misrepresent what the vision is there okay. but I have been taking notes and I'll make sure I get that back to his office yes I, I would appreciate that and I agree with the other comments about raising awareness uh, once this money is awarded uh, press release press conference whatever needs to happen mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that um, you know the community knows about this and that it's widely shared in multiple languages so there's an understanding of who can take advantage and hopefully there's a two-way communication system so that um, residents can come not just in chambers but can also contact MCPS to uh, uh, further communicate their expectations and you know a shared accountability always helps with ensuring the continued success of this program so Sorry, absolutely. And as one other piece, I just want to um, make sure folks are aware of it. Community engagement is absolutely part of this. So yeah. one of the reasons that we're not sitting here like unrolling a scroll of a complete action plan is because until we have the funding and we and we know what it's a go forward situation, then we absolutely will be bringing folks in and say, this is our vision. Yeah. Give um, us some input on this on this. And then where how do we need to adjust and adapt? And we can't do the work with the diverse community that we have unless, I think it was mentioned, we engage the, the partners so they see their culture and their experiences in the work that comes through. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to also uh, thank Councilmember um, Epibino for her thoughtful comments and questions. It touched on uh, the importance of bringing in the right people, the right programs, spending that money wi uh, very wisely, um, and um, and the importance of, as you have reiterated and, and many of my colleagues have reiterated, of working closely with impacted people in our own community here, um, with our local advocacy organizations um, that are led by and represent those impacted parties uh, as you as you make those decisions about the best, what, you know, wh who, what professional development programs are we going to bring in, what experts are we going to bring in, um, and so, uh, you know, and just really wanted to emphasize that that list that Councilman Raluki mentioned um, that as you're doing that vetting that it that's the vetting is happening for all the different communities there are so there are some communities I, I think that are more likely to say hey you didn't consult us and now you pick somebody bad you know and and, and uh, you, you know we know that that would happen there are some communities that might not you know so being really thoughtful about okay well who do I talk to to make sure we're doing the right thing by unhoused or unhoused families uh, and, and make, making sure that you're reaching out in all of those categories in, in that same way. And I know that that's something that you're thinking about, but um, I'm, I'm also saying it because I want uh, the public to know that that's something that's important to, to you, to all of us, and, uh, and that we're going to be having continuing to have that conversation in that kind of level, level of detail uh, because to Councilmember Stewart's point, um, we, you know, you could be doing all the best things in the world, but the families need to need to know it to feel that kind of security. Um, and then also want to just note the the focus on uh, data, getting good data here um, that Vice President Friedson mentioned uh, and um, Chair Jawanda mentioned, and that we have talked so much about that, which I so appreciate. Um, that I just wanted to note that it's going to be difficult to establish causal links here. Like there are so many variables. <laughs> infinite variables at play uh, and you know you're trying a lot of different things uh, which you should be doing like we've got urgent situations happening we want to do the best that we can to address them and we're getting resource grants and stuff from different places and, and all that kind of stuff um, 
but you know, I just wanted to note that that as you're thinking about that, you know, where are we going to pilot what? Uh, just really be thinking about well, how can I best isolate some variables because coming before us and saying like, hopefully we're going to see a, a reduction, right, in these, uh, uh, you know, in bullying reports and all these different things. But whatever you can do on the implementation side to assist us in breaking out. Um, some causal links to some of these individual categories and positions and programs that you're wanting funding for is just going to make those decisions uh, so much easier at budget time. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Mink. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Thank you, MCPS, for being here and being part of this conversation and helping uh, answer our questions and the questions clearly we are hearing from the community. Uh, again, uh, we want to make sure that our students um, are safe when they're at school, uh, and there's a lot that encompasses that comment, but as it relates directly to these $3 million in state, state grant funding, we want to make sure that it is used appropriately and how the community sees fit. Um, so appreciate all of my colleagues' comments and questions. Uh, is there now a motion to approve this supplemental? So moved. Second. Uh, moved by Councilmember Lutke, seconded by Councilmember Sales. All those in favor? And that is unanimous by all those present. Thank you. Okay, that was uh, the last uh, public hearing for today, but we have two <laughs> more uh, public conversations. Uh, and I am pleased to invite uh, our Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Madalino, our Director of Transportation, Mr. Conklin, um, and uh, Two nominees, but we'll start with uh, Ms. Haley Peckett, who is the county executive's nominee to serve as the county's transportation policy officer. And so I will uh, turn it over to Mr. Madalino for any introduction he'd like to provide. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the council. I know you're very excited to have these nominees in your role as chair of the Transportation Environment Committee. Um, First up, um, Ms. Peckett, uh, she um, has been with the District Department of Transportation for six years. During that time, she led the district's long-range planning um, transportation plan uh, program. So she has lots of experience at a state um, transportation department. Before that, she was with the federal government and spent uh, I believe nine years working for the U.S. Department of Transportation. She's worked at a variety of planning, civic, and regional groups. She um, was um, by far the leading can candidate, blew us out of the water with uh, her interview with, uh, with the county executive. We're thrilled that she's willing to join the Department of Transportation. I just want to note that um, with your confirmation of Ms. Peckett, we will now have a department led by two graduates of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with Chris and with Director Conklin and with the Deputy Director. And of course, um, uh, Mr. Wallanen went to Penn State, which is something I tease him about all the time. So a fine, a fine institution. So with that, um, I am the County Executive and I ask um, for your confirmation for Ms. Peckett, which I think you will want to do once you um, listen to her and, and um, answer questions. Fantastic. Thank you for that introduction. Director Conklin, you're here as window candy. Um, no. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, I just wanted to mention that I've... Dressing, been, dressing, been, candy, been, window. <laughs> it's holiday season. I'm, I'm mixing my metaphors. Uh, I've known Haley for, uh, for, I think, eight or nine years. We served on the same uh, committee at the Transportation Research Board, um, so I've had uh, the opportunity to work with her on a variety of different things outside of our normal workday um, responsibilities. So I'm very happy to have Haley with us today for your for your interview. And I also want to um, thank those who've served in this position in the acting role uh, for what's been an extended period of time as we've had uh, a couple staff changes that were unexpected and people's inability to return to work when they thought they might be able to. So it's been it's been a while since we've had a permanent person in this role and I, I'm hoping that you have a good interview today. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Peckett, welcome. Nice to see you. Um, I'll ask your first question and then you can, we, we, we can engage and open up for conversation should my colleagues want. Um, in this role, can you share with us what your approach to improving transit access in Montgomery County would be, particularly as we continue growing and becoming uh, more urban? 
Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, council members, for having me here today. Um, I am really excited that you have such a strong foundation. Your robust transit network um, as a county is one of the things that attracts me. And I love a lot of the work that's happening regionally, but especially here in Montgomery County with Ride on Reimagine and the bus network redesign. You are a leader in terms of BRT. I love seeing Flash um, gaining ridership. And I think this is a really strong foundation, but what actually helps with transit policies is having a very multimodal connections. It's one thing to have a great robust transit network, but if you can't get to where you're going, if there aren't connections, a safe and inviting pedestrian environment, connections with other modes, um, ride on that feeds to metro rail stations as well as BRT stops, that's all really important and it takes a lot of work and many years of planning and policies to get there. Um, so that's where I would really like to focus um, and make sure that people feel safe and that they have a reliable transit network that they want to ride. Fantastic. Appreciate that response. Uh, advancing racial equity and social justice is a guiding principle for Montgomery County government. And so in this role, how do you plan to create a more uh, equitable and fair transportation system for all residents? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, racial equity is extremely important. Um, it's an area that I worked in quite a bit when I worked on Move DC, the district's long range transportation plan. And I just want to highlight one example that not only was equity one of our goals, but we were very focused on making sure that all of the pieces of that plan had a way that they could be implemented and had an owner. And so for equity, we created an equity assessment tool. So this means every single budget item that the District Department of Transportation or DDOT puts forward, every project manager, whether you're in human resources or whether you're in transit, has to fill out an equity assessment survey for their project. And it's based on data, not just on race and income, but actually on how many destinations you can access via transit from your residents. So it's really about connecting residents to opportunity. So we've identified areas that are the greatest transportation need, and that's how we do the equity scores for all the projects and programs. Um, that's one example, and certainly there's lots of uh, goals that go into that, but one of the things I'd like to highlight is that not only do you hopefully end up with better outcomes in terms of projects that are equitable, but you also have all of the people at DDOT that now have to think about it. So even if you're a bridge engineer that's just saying, well, I got to support the substructure of the bridge, you are thinking about equity because you've got to fill out that tool for, for everything. Very good. Um, another priority for us here in the county is Vision Zero. And so in your opinion, how can we work within the transportation network that we have and the one that we're working towards to make sure that uh, everybody is safe on our roads? So I love talking about Vision Zero and, and the need for safety for all modes and really thinking about what that means for speeds and for our roadways. Um, a lot of times the things that will accomplish our equity goals that will help people on transit are also safer for pedestrians. Every trip starts and ends with pedestrians. So we really need to make sure that pedestrians are safe, that all modes are safe. Um, one thing that we do that is think about the policies of how we select projects and how we design projects. And so there is a need to have some tolerance for congestion, but use that as one means or one criteria of how we select what projects move forward. So. Is there safety goals? Are there climate goals? Um, and you look at how the project will affect different modes and different users. It's not simply about moving the most number of people through. If you use that as the criteria, which most local governments and frankly the federal government has done for many generations, then you end up with large highways that are not very conducive to our Vision Zero goal. So I know the county is already making a lot of strides in this area, and I'd like to support policies that continue to do so. Fantastic. Very much appreciate that, that response. Um, uh, another uh, change that we've recently made here uh, is within our land use and planning. Uh, and last year, uh, the county, uh, the council adopted what we call Thrive 2050 uh, to adapt uh, and reflect the changing environment, uh, uh, an economic and, and physical environment, uh, and recognizing that we need to rethink some of our land use decisions. And so um, how do you think that our land use planning can work with our transportation policies? That's a great question and something I was extremely interested on in early in my career. Um, it's important to think about 
you know, I think we talked about that inviting pedestrian environment or an inviting environment that people can get connected to places. If you are dropped off from a bus in the middle of a giant parking lot or in the middle of a giant highway, it's very difficult to access destinations. So I know that land use makes a big difference. The more that you can encourage dense development around transit connections helps a lot. And I think a lot of people do want to be in walkable communities. That being said, the county is extremely diverse. That doesn't make sense for all areas of the county. So I think it's about figuring out how you can create those opportunities because there are a lot of people who would like to live somewhere that is walkable, that they have multimodal options. Make sure that those opportunities exist and that that's encouraged um, and understand that that's just the, like that the way that we travel is not just commuting. It's not just one type of trip. We really have to understand, and I would really look forward to working with all of you, um, as well as regional directors and other agencies, especially the planning um, department, to be able to understand what has already worked well and what the context-sensitive solutions would be across different parts of the county. Very good. Um, last question I have for you, uh, if confirmed to this role, um, there is a lot of work that we are doing with the Climate Action Plan. And just yesterday, the Transportation Environment Committee had a more than two-hour session that was attended by nearly every county agency and department, uh, including MCPS, to talk about how we are working together uh, to combat climate change. Uh, and so uh, what, what do you think about vehicle miles traveled and about just our, our transportation infrastructure with regard to the Climate Action Plan? Yeah, absolutely. I'm very excited that you have been so forward thinking on climate. I'm really excited about the new hire for your climate officer um, and look forward to working collaboratively with you with the, and with um, Ms. Kogel Smucker in her position. Um, there's a lot of what we already said, vision zero goals, transit, uh, mode shift, that would make a big difference. But again, like we said before, like I just said, it's context sensitive. There's going to be parts of the county where reducing BMT is about carpooling or using telecommuting policies um, or about making it more convenient. So if you're going to get your groceries, you can make one car trip and be able to hit multiple things at the same time because your daycare or schools are all coordinated together in one place. Um, other places, it's going to make sense to try to work on policies that encourage shifting those modes. I've been working in parking for the last two years, uh, for three years, and there's a lot of soft pricing policy that works really well that we don't think too much about, but you make those decisions. If I'm going to go bring my family to Silver Spring for a movie and it's going to cost us quite a bit of money, as much as movie tickets to park the car, maybe it makes sense for us to try to catch the bus instead. So there's different ways that we can influence behavior. Um, I'll touch briefly on electric vehicles. There's a huge opportunity there. I think that you know, I know that Montgomery County is a leader in the state in terms of purchase of electric vehicles. Um, and there's still a lot that we can influence, especially in the next few years. There's so much money and federal policy and grants that are going into this area. It's a great moment to capitalize on how do we retrofit buildings? How do we ensure we're doing everything we can for new developments to not just meet the demand we see today, but the demand that we're going to see 15 years from now in terms of electric vehicles? Because when we make these transportation investments and these real estate investments, those are going to be on the ground for a very long time, and our transportation network will look really different then. There are more electric vehicles in Montgomery County than any other jurisdiction in the state. That is correct, uh, and we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, very much appreciate you, you answer, answering all these, these questions. Uh, I look forward to working with you uh, and the entire DOT team, uh, and I'll turn it over to colleagues who have some thoughts, and Councilmember Jawando has one. Thank you. Thank you for putting yourself forward and continuing being willing to continue to serve uh, in the public. I appreciate you mentioning right off the bat, right on reimagined. Uh, uh, Director Conklin knows this. I've been asking him for five years about right on reimagined, and and we are making our way through the, you know, the implementation and, and recommendations of, of, of that plan. Um, uh, I wanted to to ask you a little directly because when you come into these roles, I think you. It's, it's important to think about, well, what are the challenges that you, th you see? You know, you talk about how great our system is, and we are great, but I, I, you know, but we have challenges, but we also, which can lead to opportunities. And in your knowledge, you mentioned going to the movies in Silver Spring, so you have some knowledge of this area. I know, you know, uh, what do you see as our, our biggest challenges and, and biggest opportunities as you enter this role? I th will start, I'll be positive, and I'll start with a great opportunity. And from the people that I've spoken with and you know, looking at a lot like Thrive 
Montgomery and looking at a lot of the transportation plans and policies that I've already seen, people want to do, people want the goals related to safety, vision zero, climate action. I mean, the heart is in the right place. And I hear that from residents. I think you see that from your constituents. I'm really excited about that. The challenge is changing behavior. Like as with any place, but I think this is particularly true in the diverse land use across the county, it's way easier if you can afford a car to just get in a car and drive. So that's a bit of a hearts and minds, but I think there's a lot of policies we can do to make that the case as well. Um, I do think that working across and creating relationships across agencies is going to be very important. Um, I think coming out of COVID, a lot of local jurisdictions, it's not just true in Montgomery, are trying to figure out what the playing field looks like. Like I mentioned, it's not about work trips anymore. You can't just operate buses right. at peak hours. You really have to understand how how people are using transit across the day. So reaching a diverse population, really engaging, it seems like Ride on Reimagined has done a great job with that, but it is very hard to engage people who aren't taking the time to come here and say, this is actually what I need to make transportation work better for me. I appreciate you mentioning that. I mean, a number of us did the, uh, you know, the transit challenges over the years. And, and I always mention, you know, from depending on where you live, it can be harder or easier to take transit. And the majority of people that are on it in the harder places, many of them want to get want to get to a place where they can have a car because of the way we're designed. Uh, they just have to ride transit because we know that's who our transit riders are predominantly folks who have to ride it. Um, and so it's, it's heartening to hear you say that. And I'm we can talk more offline about your strategies that you're thinking about how to increase the numbers of who uses it uses it and how to make it better for everybody so i really appreciate that uh and i'm going to yield to my council member for a day who has a question as well not my r <laughs> all right hello uh, my qu question was um so have you ever ridden a ride on as just like a regular, you know, resident just going anywhere, um, not like on a tour or anything, but just, you know, regularly riding a ride-on. And then if so, how has that experience on the ride-on influenced um, or impacted any policy that you may support or, you know, introduce in your position? So thank you. That's a great question, council member. Um, I will say that I, the last, I, I don't live in Montgomery County and I frequently take transit to get around to most places. Um, and I have, the last time I tried to take a ride on, I actually could not figure out where exactly I needed to go and ended up taking a WMATA bus from Silver Spring instead. So I was a little bit confused by kind of the wayfinding and making sure I got to my destination. Um, and that may be my own fault. I will say that in general, riding transit, it's in, it's my experience is that if it's reliable and the headway adherence is pretty good and I can use information that's at my disposal, like on an app to say, hey, this bus is going to come in 20 minutes. I have time to go somewhere warm to wait while I'm waiting for this. I'm much happier than if I have no information or the bus doesn't come, which unfortunately happens quite a bit. Thank you. Very good, insightful question. Yield Thank that. you. R very insightful question. And, and, and I'll share with our council member uh, that one of the discrepancies within our ride-on system is that the average household income in Montgomery County is about $110,000. And the average household income for a ride-on rider is about $35,000. So those are the differences that we see when we ride the bus and recognize how important our public transportation system is for, for everybody. So thank you for elevating that. Council Member Balcom. Sure. Um, thank you uh, for uh, being here today. Uh, and you mentioned the diverse land use that we have in our county. I'm from the up county, Germantown, Clarksburg, Poolsville, uh, in the Ag Reserve as well. Um, and it's not often a matter, in terms of changing people's behavior, it's not a matter of the choice between a 20-minute bus ride and a 10-minute car ride. It's often the choice between a 30-minute car ride in an hour and a half transit. And that's the situation that we're in when we look at the how we justify investment in transit when there is no ridership, when the ridership numbers aren't there. But then how do we um, create ridership? How do we create that need uh, or that desire when the infrastructure isn't there? So we're continually caught in this loop of uh, ridership numbers just aren't there in the up county, so we don't ever get transit. 
so then we don't ever get ridership and it keeps going on and on. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. You certainly kind of had that that chicken and the egg. And I think that, um, Mr. President, as you mentioned with your Thrive Montgomery question, you really do have to think ahead and all of how we've developed in Montgomery County is the result of careful planning. So I think there's a question of like, there's going to be growth that happens. And as that growth happens, if there are people that are up county, if the growth will be happening up county, whatever growth will be, can we make it in a way that's sustainable and gives people that option? And if we plan ahead and say, here's a bus rapid transit system that's coming that will have some destinations and activity centers that people will want to go to, and from there they can connect to other destinations, great. If there's always going to be parts that are agricultural and that are rural in nature, and it won't make sense to have the same ridership. You can't get that coverage. That's not the place that would make sense to put the bus rapid transit in. But I do think we have to be visionary and say, when the growth is going to happen, where do we want it to happen, and how do we plan for it in a way that is going to meet our goals? And that, those goals will look different in somewhere that is more rural, um, but we still need to plan accordingly so that we've made that transportation and land use connection. Great, thank you. The, the growth is already there. <laughs> we just need to figure out how to make it work. So thank you. Councilor Malutki. Thank you. Just piggybacking on some of what Councilmember Balcom said, because I, while, while Councilmember Balcom is on the Upper East Side of the County, West Side, sorry, I am on the Upper East Side of the County. I, I don't even have a ride on bus where I live. Um, the closest bus to my house it requires a half hour walk on a road with no sidewalks. Um, so I just tried to do giving your movie example. Um, how long it would take me to get from my house to AFI to catch a movie. Um, and it's an hour and a half. And uh, I could have driven there in the time it would take me just to walk to where I could get a bus, right? And so, um, and I'm not, and I, and I do love public transit. Um, we, I, we just don't have it there. And I don't live in the Ag Reserve, right? Um, and so I do think though that in reverse, we are trying to make sure that people who do have access to transit and are able to avail themselves of that are able to come to the up county to enjoy the things we have to offer up there too. And that's been a, a, a difficult challenge. Um, it's also a challenge in terms of our students and wanting to access internships or go to a job after school where you're living in an area that is wholly car dependent and we do have large large swaths of our county land that are completely car dependent um, and so what types of things do you think would be because this is again much bigger than changing some basic behaviors it's an entire infrastructure that just does not exist up there um, how would you address that yeah, thank you, Council Member. And I, I appreciate the question because it will help me reiterate that it's very much dependent on the land use, but also the people who are living there and the growth that you envision. So if I were to come to your district and say, tell me, and I usually wouldn't ask it of like, here, rank these priorities or fill out the survey, but like, how does transportation impact your life? What improvements would you like to see? what connections don't exist, what's hard to do right now. And chances are, if you're an adult who can afford it, they probably own cars because you just noted the land use makes that almost impossible not to. But the, the youth might say, I can't get anywhere, I can't get jobs, I'm not competitive with my classmates who live in more rural, I mean, in more urban areas to get to places. I can't go to the movies without my parents dropping me off and chaperoning me, whatever. Everyone will have, and I think that there's a lot of great opportunities. There's programs um, and incentives and policies that we could use. Um, so some examples could be finding ways to carpool. Um, there might be opportunities that are not transit-based, but having activity centers and nodes that are easier to access. So if you could be dropped off as a youth or somebody who is transit-dependent in an activity center, you could access more destinations from there as opposed to having to walk a half hour from your house for a bus that only comes once an hour on Sunday. I understand that's not very realistic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for the comments and questions, Ms. Peckett. We uh, look forward to working with you. Uh, we will uh, take this up at next week's uh, session, but very much appreciate you taking the time and sharing with us your vision for the county.
Thank you, Council Members. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. We will continue talking about transportation uh, and invite Mr. Maddalena and Mr. Conklin to stay and invite uh, Mr. McLaughlin to join us, who is the County Executive's nominee to be the Manager of Transit Services for the Department of Transportation. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. Maddalena. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, Thank you for giving us the opportunity to introduce Phil McLaughlin, although some of you I'm sure know Mr. McLaughlin for, from his 23 years of service with the county government. Um, he is currently the director of operations for Ride-On. He has held probably every management position in Ride-On during his, during his career. Um, he has 35 years of transit management experience across the country. Um, he has been dedicated to Ride-On. He has been part of every one of the initiatives that we've launched. Um, flash, flex, um, and uh, um, extra. an extra, thank you. Um, so uh, he is, I think, um, the right person at the right time to lead this organization. We appreciate your working with us to change the specifications of this position. And um, I think, uh, I, I know um, Director Conklin and I have spoken many times about the um, very positive changes he has brought to ride on in a very short period of time. And the county executive and I look forward to him continuing those positive changes at ride on and meeting the goals um, and the, the um, plans that we all share for developing the best regional bus transit system. You heard Ms. Peckett talk about one of the reasons she wanted to be here was because of ride on. We offer a range of transportation services that most other local governments certainly suburbs do not provide. And um, with Mr. McLaughlin, I'm sure we will continue outstanding service for our transit riders. Well, that's what we expect. Thank you for that. Uh, Director Conklin. Yeah, Mr. Madaleno, I think hit the key points. Uh, the reason Phil is here today is because uh, Mr. McLaughlin has done a fantastic job in improving the morale of our staff and improving the operational performance and customer service. Uh, that Ride On and the other services are providing in a in a short period of time. He's been part of a three-person team that's been managing the Ride On system since our previous division chief retired, uh, and they've had a focus on employee satisfaction, engagement, and customer service, and it shows in the metrics. And I'll let Phil share some of those metrics with you uh, during during the question and answer. But it's just been a remarkable. Uh, improvement in the quality of the operation and, and safety of the operation uh, under his leadership so far. Fantastic. Thank you for those introductions. Uh, Phil, thank you for your service uh, over the years and, and uh, what I expect to be continued service as well. Uh, I just have four quick questions for you before we, we open it up. Uh, the Council, when it approved Thrive 2050, uh, we called upon the county to, quote, build a frequent, fast, convenient, reliable, safe, and accessible transit system, uh, among many other things in, in that document, uh, to improve transit times and ensure safety and, and, and access. And so uh, in, your, in, in this new role, uh, how do you uh, plan to achieve those goals moving forward? Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks for uh, having me here today, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to, to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, this job and, and any questions you may have. There was a lot of references to Ride on Reimagined um, in the previous discussion. And in Ride on Reimagined, we used a lot of um, uh, existing documents to sort of lay out some guiding principles for us. Thrive 2050 was one of those. And the guiding principles in there, the safe, reliable, convenient, accessible service, that is the hallmark of what the outcome, uh, what the recommendations from Ride on Reimagine will be. Um, we want to make sure that, that folks have, uh, as many folks, those who live in, in the outer suburbs, uh, in the northern and the eastern suburbs, have access to our transit system. So Ride on Reimagine will be. Um, uh, we're going through a recommendation stage right now. We will have a, uh, a full plan in about the next three to four months. And in there, you'll be able to see that we've expanded the coverage area. Uh, we'll implement the service over about a four to five year period. Um, but one of the things that we did a little bit differently 
in our public, partici public participation phase of Ride on Reimagine is we not only conducted traditional public sessions, public forums, public meetings, but we did a number of focus groups and pop-up meetings. And the reason we did those meetings is, you know, when you get into a focus group discussion, you get into a little bit more detail and you can really understand how people use the transit network and then you can better design the plan to fit those, those particular needs. Um, th the thing about uh, the pop-ups is we were able to get a little bit closer to the communities who may not have access to get to a primary transportation node, which is typically where we would hold these meetings. Um, and we had a lot of success, a lot of great input, um, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to launching Ride on Reimagine in the, in the coming year or so. Very good. Th uh, thank you. Look forward to having that conversation uh, with you. Uh, advancing racial equity and social justice is a top priority for all of us in county government. So uh, in, in this role, how do you plan on helping uh, foster a more equitable and fair transportation network? Thanks. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the lessons learned that we've had during the Ride on Reimagine is prior, prior to Ride on Reimagine, whenever we conducted a service change um, where we were asking for the public's input, we did it in a very... Um, stiff sort of formal way and we didn't always get the feedback that we needed. We learned from Ride on Reimagine that we want to, when we want to develop a service change we need to go out to the communities. We need to conduct pop-up meetings. We need to have focus groups if necessary. So we're going to continue that and that's an opportunity for us to get to where the people live and where they use the transit service. Um, in terms of equity, pre-pandemic we had service standards um, that spoke to maximum uh, headway on a service. So the maximum of a service would run is every 30 minutes. Um, the um, span of service was fairly consistent. When we got to the pandemic, it was a real balancing act between balancing the number of resources we had, which were primarily bus operators, and making sure that we're serving our essential functions throughout the county. Um, we have not quite recovered from that yet, so Ride on Reimagine will give us the framework and the foundation to do that moving forward. Um, which will which will uh, uh, move us into sort of where we were pre-pandemic. There was some. I'll, I'll, I'll get to it later. You'll hold that for a next question. Um, and so the next question is: How would you balance the need uh, to electrify our, our ride-on network, which is uh, underway? A uh, conversation the the T and E committee just recently had as well. Um, but while balancing the need to uh, reduce our carbon emissions through our transit network while also increasing access and ridership for, as our up county colleagues have already noted, uh, needs more coverage. Thanks. Clearly, we, we have to achieve both of those, those goals. Um, in terms of the zero emissions, uh, we have a zero emissions plan, which by 2030, we will convert all of our diesel burning, all of our fossil fueling, uh, uh, burning fuels of uh, buses to to um, uh, zero emission buses. We've begun that transition. So we're building the infrastructure. We have the infrastructure built at our Silver Spring Depot. By the spring of 2025, we'll have the infrastructure built at our, at our Gaithersburg Depot. Currently, we have about 14 buses in our fleet that are zero emissions, very small percentage. It's just about four or five percent. In the next four years, about a third of our fleet will be zero emissions by 2028. So uh, we're moving positively in that direction. I think we need to move there. There are some challenges. There are some fiscal challenges there. The cost of a battery electric bus is twice the cost of a diesel diesel fueled bus. So we'll have to address those and plan for those over time. Um, in terms of ridership, um, we, we have not recovered from the pandemic yet. So pre-pandemic, we were carrying maybe 70 to 75,000 riders per day. Um, we've averaged over about the, over about the last 10 months 55,000. But positively, in in October we saw about 62,000 riders per day. So we're we're slowly moving back to that number. But in terms of um, using Ride on Reimagine as a tool to expand our service and coverage, um, we, that'll help us grow the ridership base. But the most important thing I think we can do is retain our existing riders. We have, what we've done is, Chris talked a little bit about, you know, the work that we've done over these past 11 months as we've been part of a leadership team, um, is we have focused on our quality of service. We have been able to, do, we've identified challenges in the way we manage our service. We've been able to reduce our missed trips by 75% over this time. 
we have been able to improve on-time performance, only modestly. We're still moving there. We've identified some new issues there. Um, we've reduced the number of crashes we have by 15 percent. Okay, what the crash does is the customer is negatively impacted, the service is delayed, perhaps there's injuries involved. And what that has done is translated into additional ridership. Can't all be attributable, attributable to the improved operational metrics, but some of it is. We've retained riders who may otherwise turn over. And the, the more important thing here is that our customers are more satisfied. Our customer complaint, complaint rate over the past 10 months is down 25%. So we have a more satisfied ridership base. So I think we're moving in the direction of, of being able to be prepared to implement Ride on Reimagine and have some success and gain new riders as a result. Thank you. Uh, last question I have uh, is with regard to the Flex program that was uh, mentioned before, uh, uh, which is our on-demand transit service. Uh, for short distance and, and uh, for short distance uh, commutes throughout throughout the, the, the county, uh, we've been expanding that over the years, recognizing uh, the success and demand for it. And so, um, talk to us about what you think the future of our ride-on fleet is. Is it more of an on-demand type service like Flex, or is it more fixed routes throughout the region? Thanks. I, I think it's a combination of both. Um, you know, as we've been conducting the, we've, as I said, we had a very robust outreach, a public participation program with Ride on Reimagine, and overwhelmingly, our customers have told us, we want more demand response services. We want more of your flex program. Um, we introduced in 2019. We introduced two pilot zones: one in Rockville, one in Glenmont, Wheaton. Um, it was just eight or nine months before the pandemic. As the pandemic came, we sort of shut it down. These are smaller vehicles. We're focused on social distancing and safety on the buses. So we stopped and started at a handful of times. This, the, the success of the service has been there. There are people, and we, I mean, not just in the ridership numbers, but in the people who said they want it. So I think moving forward, we have to have, as a way of expanding our coverage um, up county on the east and up county to the north, to make sure that we can um, broaden the coverage area. Flex is a great way to do that and connect people back to the transportation network. But the success of the Flex and the demand response service is dependent on the fixed route network. So we need to, through Ride on Reimagine, we need to address this fixed route network by expanding our span of service, expanding the days of the week we have service, and increasing the frequency on many of our routes as well. Great. Uh, and uh, as has been mentioned and, uh, by you and, and Ms. Peckett before, well, when can the council expect the, the Ride on Reimagined report? That would be sometime in the spring. We are, we are working through the recommendation phases right now, and then we want to develop an implementation plan. So I th I'm thinking sometime in the spring. We don't have a set date for that yet. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, open it up to colleagues, and we'll start with Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, Mr. McLaughlin, thank you for your continued service. Your answers prove that you're truly an expert on air transit service, without question. My question has to do not so much with the service, but the operators. How are we doing hiring and retaining bus operators? We're struggling. It's a challenge. Um, we're uh, Currently, we're short about 20 bus operators that we need. Um, we, as again, this is this is sort of sort of a hangover from from uh, from the pandemic. We've not quite recovered yet. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, it has become a different job than it was in the previous years. Um, so it's a matter of us getting out there, finding the right people, getting them through our training program, and then getting them into our system. There's there's some challenges there. Well, and from what I understand, it's not just getting them through our training program. We're training them for WMATA in some cases. They leave us and go to another agency. So we have to figure out how to keep them. I think that trend has slowed. Okay, uh, good. I, I do know that that was, that was thematic uh, a, year, a couple years ago. I believe that trend has slowed. In fact, we've hired, rehired uh, some folks who, had, who were with us at one time but went to, went to WMATA. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for all your work. I have heard a lot about you, and I think uh, um, I think we're honored to have you part of the Montgomery County team. So I'm just going to say that already, which means you know where, how I'm going to vote, I guess. Um, you know, I, I have said this before. I grew up using transit. I was born in a huge city in South America, and then when I came here, for me, Montgomery County was like 
the countryside was rural because of the lack of public transportation. Um, in a way, we need to make transit uh, sexy, make people want it, and uh, in another way, really emphasize the need of having more ridership. And I look forward to re the reimagining ride on. Um, the huge need, I, I represent the Wheaton, Glamont, Forest Glen area. Lots of people taking the bus. And the number one complaint that I hear is the bus doesn't go into the neighborhoods. So yes, it's on Georgia Avenue, University Boulevard, but what about if you live in the heart of a neighborhood, walking there, it's it's a pain, especially in places where there are no sidewalks. So huge challenge and huge need to address, and I look forward to seeing that being addressed in that reimagining right on um, that you have, that you're working on, and how it connects to other uh, transit uh, systems like, you know, MARC, uh, the Purple Line, and so on and so forth. The last thing I will say is that I had a great meeting with, uh, a whole bunch of kids from high schools in my district about two weeks ago, and uh, we were talking about opportunities for after-school after programs, and the number one challenge they had is like, yeah, we have their activities in different places, but we can't get there. Even if I live in Wheaton, going to the Civic Center in downtown Silver Spring for a huge, you know, forum, it's, it's hard because we, just, we can't get there. The other challenge I heard is having the lack of, of having ride-on buses from middle and high schools to the rec center, to the library, to the mall for kids who work there. Um, there's kids. It's hard for kids to do that, and um, and I feel like that's that's just so common sense. And how is it that we're not there yet? It it really is mind blowing to me. Um, uh, but so I I'm hoping that in this new project that you guys have been working on for a long time you're going to be addressing it and um anyway i look forward to working with you and with you too in the group. i didn't say anything Thank i just you. wanted to save it uh, <laughs> bye um council member fanny gonzalez um we are working very hard right now with the montgomery county public schools to figure out a transportation solution to get people, students to rec centers and libraries for after school programming. So we've heard that call. We are we are sitting down and having very productive meetings with MCPS about how to how to address this issue because we are providing great services both in the school system and our and our rec and libraries. How do we make them f more accessible and using the Department of Transportation in the school system to help bridge that gap? Thank you for raising that, uh, Mr. Maddalena. It's a conversation that we've been talking a lot about. I remember about five years ago, there was a joint HHS T and E committee uh, session to, to talk about that, uh, and it was one of the reasons we we moved to make buses free for all kids, which increased youth ridership by nearly seventy percent as well. Uh, Councilmember Juando. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm glad I went after Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. Um, it, I had a little. Uh, deja vu moment. I remember being the, the new council member five years ago, and then we would say something, and then one of the, the council members that had been here said, well, we've been asking about that for eight years or whatever, you know. <laughs> and and um, But the issue of co-locating, and Director Conklin, we've talked about this for a long time, at places, when I was leaving for libraries, I used to use libraries as an example, we need to make sure we move the actual stops to where people need to go, right? And I know that's part of Ride On Reimagine, so I'm I can't can't wait to read it over you know and uh, to dig into it and and, and hopefully join some TNE and full council sessions on it. Uh, I think it's a it's an amazing opportunity uh, and really appreciate also I uh, was what I was going to mention so I'll just double tap it the the work that uh, I want to hear more about and maybe we can do a, a, a TNE ENC session or on the work you're doing with MCPS to talk about the co-location uh, or, or even to do it at full council. But I want to know more about that. That's something we've been, a lot of us have been talking about for a long time. That's good to know. In addition to working with the Department of Trans the Transportation and MCPS on the after school bus issue, which for, for activities, and because they're all interrelated. And so really glad to hear that that's happening. So uh, thank you for your service. Um, I th the last thing I want to say is on the flex. Uh, I've toured that a couple times with several of you. I think it's a, I'm so glad to hear we're looking to expand that uh, and that the ridership, if I heard you correctly, that there is more demand for that. Did I hear you say that? There's more, 
the, the ridership would not mandate the demand yeah, here for those particular but the, but the the people during our public participation sessions for ride on reimagine it was it's so overwhelmingly popular. This is what people talk about. This is what they want to use, especially it's what they do with other trans like with the younger children. Yeah, 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 the younger guys. Yeah. Okay. So, so could you s just speak to that a little more? So, how are you thinking about? You have the two pilots that you you do, those are done or they're still going? No, those are still going. Okay. So, in our draft, pl it's a draft right now. It's open for public comment. So we've received uh, 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 many many comments. We have identified 13 potential flex zones. Okay, they're just you know identified. We want to get we're receiving comments now. Um, again, they would be geofence zones around communities, around uh, uh, transportation nodes of some sort. In the north, it might be Germantown Transit Center. In the east, it could be uh, Montgomery General Hospital at, at Olney. Um, they'll each be around a transportation node, um, but it also relies on the expansion of the fixed route network. Okay, which is a little bit what we were talking about earlier. Um, what we have, we're, we have a concept for two hybrid zones. So you'd operate as a fixed route for eight, ten miles, and then when you get to say Poolsville or Damascus or Burtonsville, things a little bit further from the core, you would then turn into a, mm -hmm. a demand response service serving communities getting a little bit closer. Um, we're still fine tuning that one because it requires a, a different type of vehicle. The demand, the success of the demand response is, I, someone had raised it earlier, is that you get into the neighborhoods, you get a little bit closer to, to people's houses, and they don't have to walk that right. considerable distance. If there could be physical challenges to do that walk as well, so that's one of the benefits. But you need a smaller vehicle to get into sure. those neighborhoods. That's exciting. Are you guys still utilizing the Via technology? Is that the we partner? are still using that? Okay. Yeah, and Via has been a very, very good partner. Good, good. Well, thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that. That's exciting to hear. I think there's great growth opportunity there. And good. congratulations you. in advance. You know how, you. how I'm voting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Sells. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, thank you, sir, for um, stepping up to this new position. I um, am really looking forward to hearing some of the ideas that uh, you have regarding um, some of the complaints that we've received regarding. Um, safety at the transit stations, uh, the stops. Um, we talked about uh, pedestrian safety and safe routes to schools, um, but some of the, uh, not all of the bus stations are adequately, um, uh, uh, have the infrastructure for safety, whether it's the lighting, um, you know, our last um, panelist talked about uh, being confused only some of the transit stops have the monitors there. And so just wondering how we're going to um, ensure that there's equitable infrastructure across our transit system so that more people feel more comfortable and confident when riding and navigating the system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Albernaz. Oh, I think he did. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. Safe, safety is definitely a challenge. I, I met with a uh, group of Blair High School students earlier this week, and they they raised exactly that issue. And uh, you know, safety. Um, we we have 5,400 bus stops. So managing safety at each one of those in a, in a county that's 500 square miles, it, it, it's challenging. Um, but we need to we need to figure out the best way to do that. We don't have a plan for that right now, but okay. we need to figure out the best way to do that. To, to make pe pe people is, comfortable. Yeah. Yes, budget season's coming up, so I look forward to hearing your recommendations. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, thank you for your service, Mr. McLaughlin. I understand there's only one downside. You're a Phillies fan. That's a problem, um, <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll overlook that. Um, and we do very much appreciate your public service. I'm familiar with your work, um, and it it does precede you. Um, just. Following in line with some of the comments of my colleagues, as we reimagine right on and what's possible given the set of circumstances we've all been through as a country these last five years, um, the, we've done a lot of analysis on public health challenges, and the number one issue is access to transportation. Uh, literally being able to get to and from medical appointments, to and from dental appointments. And so I would just strongly encourage you, as, as I know you already do, um, work with our Department of Health and Human Services and our public health team. But I think there's a real opportunity now for us to be even more intentional in ensuring that we conduct analysis on where these folks are coming from and how to make it as easy as possible for them to access county services. Um, you know, I've seen 
many success stories uh, in the aging space um, where we've been more intentional in providing write-on service to our aging population. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for us to evaluate that while we're looking at these other options to better connect dots. Vice President Friesen. Well, thank you very much. I won't echo everything that other colleagues have said. I will say that you have a very strong uh, character reference from Dr. Orlin, which I'm not sure if that helps you or hurts you, but uh, I just want you to know that he strongly endorsed your, your candidacy. I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, piggyback a little bit off of uh, Council, uh, Council Member Albernaz's point. Uh, everybody needs access to transportation. To your point and to the point that was made earlier, the question of what is an appropriate level of transportation service for the needs of a, of a particular place or a particular community, that might change. That might be different. But everybody needs access to transportation in order to get to medical appointments, in order to get to jobs, in order to get to be able to access a high quality of life. And that's why it's so important. I agree with all the points of uh, making sure that everything is working together, having bus stops that don't necessarily serve public buildings and, 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 uh, and, and other public needs uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think the same is true with public connections to private entities, like healthcare, for instance. Much of our healthcare network is not, you know, these are not public facilities. These are private facilities, but they require our public to be able to access them. And so really thinking through that, I look forward to that. Also note, we changed this position, as was noted earlier. Uh, part of the goal of changing this position was to make it more accountable to more accountable to the county executive, more accountable to the county council, more accountable to the public. I think it also reflects the interest that we all have in this job and in the oversight of transit services. That is not new, but it is at the highest point of interest from policymakers I think that it has ever been uh, in the county and I think is uh, in many ways a mandate uh, for you uh, to be communicative, uh, to be accountable, to do the things that you have done throughout your career serving uh, Montgomery County, but an even uh, higher profile role in an even uh, greater way, and to make sure that we are uh, addressing and communicating to the public. Uh, this is not no longer a bureaucratic position in a back room somewhere that is not accessible. It is a public interview process. It is a formal public appointment. It you know is intended to. Uh, you know, directly uh, serve the needs uh, of the community uh, without a lot of interference. And I hope you uh, really, you know, uh, lean into that and see that as a real opportunity uh, to engage the public from this role in a way that it really hasn't previously and uh, really could be and, and balance your incredible background serving the community for multiple decades uh, with the change in this position, which I think allows you some more leeway to be able to do additional outreach and to serve the community in a more direct way uh, than was previously envisioned uh, by this role. So good luck. I look forward to supporting you, uh, notwithstanding uh, the, the character uh, reference, maybe because of, maybe despite, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, really uh, appreciate uh, all your work and look forward to working together with you and, and colleagues uh, to advance our transit goals. Thank you, Thank you colleagues. Uh, I'm I, I very much appreciate everyone's thoughtful questions uh, and, and interest in, in not only Mr. McLaughlin, but our two nominees today. Uh, and Mr. McLaughlin, uh, I'll, I'll add that what I very much appreciate about what you shared today was the intentionality of hearing from riders and residents. Uh, you know, we had a, a, a master plan conversation earlier today uh, in which we very much referenced uh, our, uh, our listening uh, ability to listen and willingness to go into the communities to hear directly from residents and riders. Uh, and I think that's the only way that we're going to continue succeeding uh, and providing services that everybody wants. And so appreciate that leadership. Look forward uh, to working with you. Um, and we will have this on the agenda for, I believe, next week as well. Uh, but look forward to working with both of you and, and of course, the CAO and Director Conklin as well. So thank you. Mr. Thank you. President, can I? Um, and uh, oh, can I, sorry. Can I uh, Mr. just a, yeah. a point of personal privilege? Uh, um, I very much um, want to thank you. I don't know if I'll have the opportunity to thank you for your leadership over the last year as the council president on behalf of the office of the county executive, the 10,000 um, 
people that work for the county government very much appreciate your leadership, um, your collegiality and collaboration over the last year. Um, I very much enjoyed you and I representing the county in Korea together. Um, that was quite the adventure. Um, you and I have known each other for 15 years. It's been an honor to work with you. And um, thank you for that. You've left an indelible mark on the county government. Your work on pedestrian safety and the mandates that are included in that law will live on for generations in the county. And um, on behalf of the county executive and our colleagues, we very much wanted to thank you for your, for your service and continue to look forward to working with you as chair of the t and &E committee. I also want to take the opportunity to thank um, the members of the GO committee, certainly um, Chairman Stewart, for um, our work together on the OPEB policy. That was a long time coming. I think it puts us in a very strong um, position. And I want to thank Councilmember Stewart, Councilmember Friedson, Councilmember um, Katz for their work and collaboration. And of course, um, the work behind the scenes with Councilmember Friedson on the security grant program. Um, you know, and I think a lot of ink or digital or, um, digits are spent on discussing the differences between the executive branch and the legislative branch, but overall, day in, day out, we work together to provide 24 hour, 20, 365 day coverage for the county government. And I think it's important for the residents to know how much we value working with all of you and the advice and the feedback that you give us. And we very much look forward to that continuing relationship, um, collaboration, collegiality with, uh, with the new leadership of the, of the council. Well, Mr. Madaleno, thank you very much for that. You know, the, the reason we all work together uh, is because we're all part of the same team and we're all Team Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for highlighting that and thank you for the spirit in which you and the entire executive branch uh, bring to Rockville, bring to the council, and that we, we, we share in those efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, we are done with the agenda, but I would like to defer to the council member for a day to motion us and uh, to adjourn if she would like to do so, unless she wants to stay here all day. <laughs> not, not today, not today. She'll come back for that. <laughs> yeah. Motion to adjourn the meeting. There you go. So moved. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. That was the most important part of the whole day. <laughs>